On this historic night from sunny San Diego, California, we celebrate the artistry of combat, the mastery of technique, and the boundless courage that fuels these warrior souls. Tonight, from the Pachanga Arena, it is the landmark event, Bellator 300. And a trifecta of title fights comprises this tricentennial numbered event. The main card, it will be a gold rush. And oh, what a rush it promises to be. The main event, the semifinals of the $1 million lightweight World Grand Prix undefeated champion, Usman Nurmagomedov defends against former champ Brent Primus in a grudge match years in the making. All time great, Chris Cyborg defends the featherweight title against one of the best female fighters to never have won a championship, Kat Zingano. And and Liz Carmouche will defend the title in a friend turns to foe match against the former champion Alima Leigh McFarland. But Carmouche can be the only one to walk out the champion. A win or a draw, she retains the belt. If McFarland wins, the title will be vacated. Big John McCarthy, Mauro Ranallo, we've got a plethora of pulsating prelims coming your way. So let's get it unleashed in the heavyweight division as we kick off Bellator 300. Two fighters making their respective pro debuts. Former pro football player Josh Hokett squaring off against Spencer Smith. As you said, pro debut, both guys coming in and putting it on the line in their first fight as professionals. With the official introductions, here is the intergalactic voice of Bellator MMA, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Bellator 300. As we get the prelims underway now, we'll kick things off inside the Bellator cage with three five-minute pounds in the heavyweight division. Introducing first, the blue corner, at six foot two, weighing in 247.8 pounds, making his professional debut. He fights out of Long Beach, California, Spencer Smith. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot one, weighing in 246 pounds, even. He too today makes his professional debut fighting out of Albuquerque, New Mexico by way of Fresno, California. Josh, the incredible Hawkins. And when the bell rings, we'll welcome back to the MMA cage referee Mike Beltran. Good to see Mike Beltran back as a referee as we get started. Josh Hokett, former 49er, Fresno State Bulldog wrestler, Spencer Smith, wrestled at Cerritos College, junior college level, and they will come to the center of the cage sporting those commemorative golden gloves. Oh, and that almost proved to be a golden shot, that lead right hand for Hokett as he lands the first significant blow of the fight. It was a golden shot, a beautiful right hand right down. That definitely got Spencer Smith's attention right away. And Hokett bringing that bulldog mentality from Fresno State, where he was a two-time NCAA Division I All-American, a fullback with the 49ers. And, man, he'd like to have the success in the cage that they're having so far this season. <laughs> Undefeated at 4-0. And, of course, when we mention football this week we lost a legend one of your heroes dick butkus the monster of the midway john and i know he would appreciate a, a throwdown between two heavyweights in the bellator cage there's one thing he would love it's just the two guys just going at it right now both guys you're trying to get that feel out get the butterflies out this pro debut you know that their adrenaline was going at the start just trying to take their time Okay, fighting out of Jackson Wink MMA in Albuquerque, New Mexico, trains with the likes of All Day Davion Franklin, who we will see in action later tonight as part of the prelims. There's a long distance shot by Hokett, able to take the back of Smith. Smith quad pod right now, now the tripod. It needs to be stated, Hokett, you know, and his brother was an unbelievable wrestler. It's fights for Bellator. Hokett, very good wrestler. And this position right here, this is where he's going to live. He's going to be in that 
nice top position controlling the body of Spencer Smith. Yeah, he hopes to have a more successful Bellator MMA debut than his brother Isaiah, who was stopped in just 10 seconds. But since then, three wins in a row, a decision, a knockout, a submission. So he is rolling just like his brother Hokin is here in the first round with two minutes now gone. It's been all the incredible Hulk. All that, that's good work by Hokin. He's just starting to just plug, push holes into Smith's gas tank, big shots, heavy, going right back to the leg. Both, both of them fighting for the first time as professional Smith coming forward. He went two and two as an amateur with one knockout, and he fights out of CMMA, fighting out of Long Beach, California, has been tutored by the likes of uh, well, one of the greats, Josh Barnett, former UFC champion, a longtime pro wrestler, actually returned to the pro wrestling ring this past weekend in his home part of the country, the Pacific Northwest, for AEW. And as uh, things settle down here, John Smith beginning to try to find his range and try to back up Hogan. Yeah, and he's doing a good job of just trying to land that right hand down the pipe. He's making it straight, which gets it there quicker. Under two minutes left as they both chuck heavy leather. Yep, Smith listening to his corner, coming forward, and there's an overhand right job that curled behind the guard of Hokit. Hokit trying to find the range with the jab. Now, Hokit is trying to use his footwork to set up that right hand. He's just not finding the range right now. Smith no with a left hook to the body. Smith is he's plotting with his feet, but he keeps on marching forward, and he's being effective. Under a minute and a half left in the first round of this heavyweight tussle between two debutantes looking to get that all-important first win out of the way. There's a calf kick by Hokin off balance. Final 60 seconds of the first round, and Smith fires back with a low leg kick. A nice low calf kick. Those, oh, sharp shot many. from Hokin. That's what Ho Hokin needs to do that. Look, he's faster afoot than Smith is, and he ne needs to use that footwork to get him in and out, use that jab, pop the jab, and use your footwork to get you out of distance. It told us that his overall athleticism would be one of the biggest advantages that he would have, but after a, a bit of a rough start, Smith, Sir Smith, has overcome the adversity and now finding some rhythm and able to land some shots of his own like that lead left. Hokit doing a nice job though of just keeping himself nice and relaxed, but when he's taking those shots, takes a lot of the steam yeah, off of him. Exactly. And, he's do, and he's doing it without throwing his hands. You gotta throw your hands first to set that shot up. There's a one-two by Smith that backs Hokit up. The heavyweights have completed one round. Right here, take a look at the big right hand. That was right at the start of the fight. Really missed the mark. Kind of got him towards the collarbone neck area. Just missed that chin a little bit. But as you see Spencer Smith coming forward, it was that beautiful jab. That's what Hokit was living off of. And he was using his footwork to land that jab. Now, Spencer Smith had some big shots in that round. But overall, with the takedown, with the shots that he landed on the ground and that jab, it might be Josh Hokit who ended up taking the round. Right there, go back. All right, gentlemen, second round. Ready to fight. Ready to fight. Hell, let's go. Well, and round two, you heard Josh Hokin getting instructions from longtime kickboxing coach, part of the Jackson Wink power duo with the great Jackson Mike Winklejohn. And there is the low. Takedown changing levels and uh, Hokit dragging Smith to the mat and immediately taking us back. 
Nice job of dragging him down to the mat. He wants to get that right hook in if he can, but the cage is basically stopping him. As we mentioned, was a two-time All-American at Fresno State in wrestling at 197 at heavyweight, making his heavyweight debut as a mixed martial artist and now forcing Smith to carry his weight. Smith back to his feet here now, looking to turn in, but eats a knee on the exit. But that was a nice job by Smith because he was trying to use the fence to scrape, poke it off of him in the end, got free. Sharp jab again by Hokit. A minute has elapsed here in the second. Hokit switching. Orthodox southpaw trying to bedevil Smith, trying to find some kind of mental edge. As Smith again lunges forward with the left, but because he's overextending, taking a lot of steam off of his intended punch. Oh, but not that real counter right by Hogan. Bounced off of Smith's noggin. That was a nice, solid shot, but Smith ate it well, and he's coming forward still, so. But well done by Hogan. He saw that opportunity, he saw the opening. Smith needs to stop winding up on the shots. He's starting to telegraph when those shots are coming. He wants to shoot those hands straight from the oh, That's a good combination and actually well done. The lead left hook to the body, the right hand upstairs, followed by a body kick. And you no you'll notice he did not wind up. And there the counter right uppercut from Smith, but Hogan loading up on that right hand. He had predicted a first round knockout courtesy of the right hand. Here he is in round two still searching for the money shot. Sometimes all of our predictions go right out the window when someone's punching back. There's a jab from Smith. Lead overhand right connects for Hogan. Level change, single legs, and immediately Hogan pounces on the back of Smith. So as he was stepping in there, that's when you want to step through to get that hook in. He wasn't able to do it. There goes that left hook, but nice job by Smith to leave that leg. And I'll give it to Hogan. I like the fact that he will drag himself down with his opponent, knowing that he has the advantage. Just don't let your opponent turn on you at this point. Three of seven in the takedown department for Josh Hokit. Hard shot. 25-year-old delivering jackhammer-like right hands from the back, but Smith able to get to the fence and back up to his feet. And Smith's corner asking for a back elbow to Hokit's face. Matt returned by Hokit and Smith grabbing the fence. Grab that, which changes that takedown. Uh, still in a position where he's on his, he's against the canvas, but yeah, that definitely changed where they were going to end up. Smith doing a great job of using that fence as a balance point to work himself back to his feet continuously. Just over a minute oh. remaining in the second. Two knees from Hokan, followed by a right hand, and Smith standing up and still walking forward, but he ate three nasty shots from Hokan. And that first knee moral absolutely landed flush. I got to give it to Spencer Smith. He has got a chin. Coming up on the final 45 seconds of the second round, you're watching action in the Bellator heavyweight division. We were supposed to see Ryan Bader defend the heavyweight title against Linton Vassell in a rematch on the main card. Vassell forced to withdraw due to illness as Smith again attacks the liver with that left hook. 30 seconds left in the middle frame. Sharp jab lands again for Hokit. Smith, no movement, no head moving off center line. Oh, exactly. He's, his head is has zero. It's straight, straight there. It's a great target for Hokit. Yeah, great target for Smith attacking the lead leg of Hokit with that calf kick. That lead leg starting to get eaten up. Hey, that's your second warning. You understand? That's a hard warning now. You understand? Don't grab the fence. We just heard referee Mike Beltran warning Spencer Smith, a hard warning, don't grab the fence. Let's listen in. 
Keep those tens, keep those tens coming. Hey, when you level change, if you want he's fucking so bad, he's gonna duck to an uppercut if you want it, if you want to come back up with one of those after you level change. Still Big right hand right here by Josh Hokey. That was beautifully placed. Nice attempt by Spencer to come back with that counter shot, but that's the shot right there. Once he got him around, Hokit is landing huge shots. Here comes that huge knee right there, and a second one that wasn't quite as bad. That was a heavy knee that he took up against the cage. Family plays a big part when it comes to fighting. Third and final round, we will definitely see a lot of that coming up on our Gold Rush main card. All three fights, title fights, except for Alima Leigh McFarland, the inaugural flyweight champion who missed weight and will not be eligible to win the flyweight belt for a second time. But we have Isaiah Hokett and Mike Winklejohn giving instructions to Josh Hokett. And after two rounds, John, how do you have it on your unofficial scorecard and one? Unofficially, I've got Josh Hokett winning both of those rounds. The, the first one was close, but he landed the cleaner shots overall. Second one wasn't close. He landed the heavier shots, more shots, everything. It's a matter of Spencer Smith's corner told him, you got to go out and get him, which is going to open up Spencer Smith for some of the shots that Josh Hokett is, but it also puts Josh in a position. He knows the guy's going to come after him. You got to watch out for the big shot. Smith has the right idea with that left hook to the body, but needs to set it up better. And of course, both of them with each and every second gaining valuable experiences. This is their first time. And oh, by the way, they're doing it under the bright lights of Bellator MMA. But both guys were performing very well. There is Josh Hokett and Mike Winklejohn. He's not defending it. Just keep taking it. Just keep taking it. Hokett. Yep. Yep. Isaiah Hokett, his brother, talking right there. Hands up. Hands up. When you go, hands up. Good. Nice job. Beautiful. Beautiful. There's the jab again from Hokett, but doesn't follow with that right hand. And there's a head kick partially blocked by Hokett from Smith, but the jab is money. Josh Hokett really needs to just rely on that jab. Use it, set it up, and that'll bring the right hand in and then the left hook. Two fighters with a wrestling background. It's going as expected. We had Hokett, of course, take it to the ground, but for Smith, obviously, content to try to try, but the, the head movement. And now, finally, a little bit, little bit more head little movement after he's the jab. Uh, Hokett, four for eight you. in the takedown department, right? And Smith yet to attempt a, a takedown. And there's that jab again from Josh Hokett with two minutes and 45 seconds left in the final round. Hokett doing a nice job. You see that movement moving towards the weak side of Spencer Smith. Spencer keeps on trying to hit him with the big right hand. He keeps on moving himself away. That's going to take some of the sting off of the hip hands. The jab has been effective, but it's been a single shot. Needs to piece together combinations, does Josh Hokett past the midway point of the final round, but it has dictated the terms for the most part for Josh Hokett. And it's messed up the, the face of Spencer Smith in his pro debut. But well, one of the things that Spencer Smith has been very successful with is that low calf. Yes. And he needs to stick with it. It's going to take a lot of that movement away. In fact, Smith 13 of 23 in the kicking department. Hokett 7 of 8. And there is Josh Barnett. Nice takedown right there by Hokett. With a fifth takedown secured. That's Josh Barnett and Chad George in the corner of Spencer Smith. Chad George, an outstanding yes, grappler. The head coach of the Spencer Smith. And so Hokett looking to seal the deal with this takedown. Try to advance to full mount. Opens Close. half guard. Take a look at that arm triangle. He's looking coming. for the arm triangle submission in his professional debut. And there is the tap. And Josh Hokett gets the finish in the final round. 1-0 oh, with an arm triangle choke. 
from the wrestling mat to the gridiron to being successful for the first time in the Bellator MMA cage. Josh Hokett, welcome to Professional Mixed Martial Arts. You know, all of this, the finish comes because it starts with the takedown. Here he goes. Didn't do a good job of setting up with his hands, but he got into Smith because Smith was getting a little bit more tired. And he put him to where he was on his butt away from the cage. And he used that cage so well to get himself back up. But there you go. That arm triangle. Big, heavy guys. There's his brother, Isaiah. Mike Winkle, John. Giving themselves a little high five for, yep, we taught him how to do that. We just came from Dublin, Ireland, Bellator 299, where there was a record three arm triangle chokes in a Bellator MMA show. We start Bellator 300 with an arm triangle choke. Josh Hokett representing Jackson Wink MMA and picking up that all important first Duke. Here's what it is. Let's make it official. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the head and arm choke ends it. The tap officially 348 into round number three. He'll begin as an undefeated professional by submission. The winner, Josh, the incredible home. Mr. McCarthy, don't make Josh Hokett angry. You wouldn't like him when he's angry. The incredible <laughs> Hulk picking up a uh, submission win via arm triangle choke, an impressive performance in his professional mixed martial arts debut, handing Spencer Smith a defeat in his first fight as a pro. But you, it's it's one of those you want to get that you know big win and the, you want it to be fast, but you also want to get that time in the cage. And he got that time. He had a great performance. He ends up getting the finish in the third round. That's what you're looking for. That was a great fight for Josh Hoka. A great night for all of us here at Bellator MMA. John, this past Thursday. They marked the 20th anniversary of my involvement in this great sport, making my debut at Pride Fighting Championships. Bushido won next month, represents your 30th anniversary involved in mixed martial arts. And here tonight, Bellator 300. And on the main card, it is a gold rush. All three title fights, unfortunately, for Lima Lay McFarlane, who's had the weight of the world on her shoulders, raising millions of dollars for the wildfire victims of her native Hawaii, unable to make weight, ineligible to become a champion for the second time, as she well takes on her, her longtime friend, training partner, woman that got her involved in the sport. And now they go at it for five rounds or less to kick off Bellator 300 main card. You know, sometimes life is just, there's too much of us going out in different directions. And for Alina Le, yeah, she's not going to be able to get that title, but she is still fighting for the people of Hawaii. And that means the world to her, so she's going to put on the best performance she can. And she's going to try to make that a vacant title. Long time grudge match. Uh, really looking forward to Chris Cyborg and Kat Zingano finally getting it on for the Bellator featherweight title. And if you're looking at, you know, Chris Cyborg has just been there, done that with everyone. But the people that are always trying to beat her are always trying to take her to the ground and never have had that wrestling ability to do it. But Katzengano, she does have that wrestling ability. So she has the tools that are needed to give Chris problems. And we will, of course, see Usman Nurmagomedov defend the lightweight title against former champ Brent Primus in the semifinals of the $1 million World Grand Prix. And we are set for action in the flyweight division. The number 10 ranked, Dilara Jowani, takes on Jenna Bishop, who is 1-0 in the Bellator cage. And you take a look, 11-7. Jowani's got a lot of experience, a lot of good fights that she's come out and wins here in Bellator. 5-0 and an excellent ground game for Jenna Bishop. With the official introductions, here is Michael C. Williams.
Tonight here inside Pechanga Arena, Bellator, 300 prelims now go to the flyweight division. Set for three, five minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot four, weighing in 125.4 pounds. Coming off her successful Bellator debut, she remains undefeated at five and oh, fighting out of San Diego, California, Jenna. Across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot three, weighing in 125.6 pounds as a professional. 11 victories, seven defeats. She fights out of Natal, Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil, presenting Ilaha Johanne. And your referee in charge, Jonathan Romero. Ilara Jowani, the 29-year-old, has won two of her last three fights, looking to bounce back from defeat against Bruna Allen. And, of course, Jenna Bishop, representing her hometown of San Diego, California, Are you ready? by way of St. Charles, ready? Missouri. We heard the crowd fully behind Bishop as they touched their commemorative golden gloves to mark Bellator 300, and that'll leave a mark, that body kick from Jawani to Bishop to begin the first round. Now that kick will definitely get your attention if you're Jenna Bishop. And that's what we're gonna see Jawani going after this whole time. She wants to stay in the stand-up. She knows how good Jenna Bishop is on the ground. That was a beautiful right hand that oh. just popped the head back on Jenna Bishop. Aggressive start by Jawani. Already scoring with blows to the body and upstairs mixing the punches and kicks and blitzing Jenna Bishop who has thus far weathered the storm like a parka. Another body kick from Joani. And John, you mentioned Bishop's credentials on the ground. She is a ground guru. Her lineage from Carlos Gracie to Elio Gracie to Euler Gracie to her coach, J.W. Wright, who gave her her black belt. So she's done it the right way, and she's looking to take this fight to the ground and does so. But look at the escape by Joani. Great balance in the top position. Beautiful job of the wizard to get herself up. Almost good looking for the leg lock by Jenna Bishop, but a great job by Yoani to get herself back to her feet. That wizard saved her from being on the bottom. Beautiful work. Yoani, as we have already seen, an aggressive fighter telling us that her ground game continues to improve, but with someone like Bishop as they now engage in that tie plumber double collar tie and it's Bishop getting the knee strikes looking to change levels once that body lock has Jawani pinned to the fence and now Jawani's on the canvas beautiful takedown nice body lock used that sweep took the leg away from Jawani this is exactly where Jenna Bishop wants to be on, in the top position on the ground this is her world Bishop made her Bellator debut at Bellator 291 in February of this year, picking up the win over Alina Kalyanadu, and now looking to submit Joani here in the first round. That was a beautiful switch from Mount to taking the back. Going after the arm now. Going for the arm bar. Bishop looking to extend the arm of Joani. The only problem that Bishop has right now is where the fence is at. Is it's going to hurt her as far as she wants to try to swing her body around. Jawani's been submitted once. It was via armbar, but that was over, well, a decade ago. Great job of taking the arm. There it is. For the first time in a decade, Jawani taps out to an armbar. Jenna Bishop with a huge win in front of a partisan crowd at the Pachanga Arena. Legit lineage, legit finish for Jenna Bishop. Legit everything. You take a look, she took big shots. She survived those shots, got the fight where she wanted it, and from that point, look out, she was on fire. And here you go, look at, gets into the body lock position. This is due to the, you see they're getting into that Muay Thai plot. Beautiful job of outside reaping the leg. Takes her time, moves to mount from this position. Yawani decides, I've got to move out of that. Takes the back. And when Yawani gives this position right here, there goes the arm, and she just takes her time. 
Beautifully done. Tries to loosen her up a little bit. You see how she twists that arm out. Heavy hips up. That is a beautiful arm bar submission by Jenna Fisher. Halloween night. 2013, Priscilla D'Souza submitted Joani with an armbar. Now, 10 years later, Jenna Bishop does it again. Bishop now 6-0 with three submissions, a perfect 2-0 in the Bellator MMA cage. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, the verbal submission brings it to an end. It was the armbar that brought it on. Official time, 2 minutes 45 seconds into round number one. She'll stay undefeated by submission. Jenna Bishop! The number 10 ranked Ilara Jawani has just been submitted by Jenna Bishop, the 37-year-old who's now rolling at six and oh. And speaking of rolling, Bellator 300 prelims continue after this. You celebrate, Miss Bishop. November 17th from Chicago, Yaroslav Amazov returns to defend his welterweight belt against the ass-kicking machine, Jason Jackson. Bantamweight champ, Sergio Pettis, and recent Grand Prix winner in the Bantamweight division, Patchy No Love Mix, fight to see who's best at 135 pounds. And Alexander Shabli meets Patricky Pitbull in the semis of the lightweight World Grand Prix. Bellator MMA, where warriors rule. Hey, Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. Tonight, Bellator 300 touts three world title bouts in one sitting. Liz Carmouche and Alima Lane McFarland put friendship aside in pursuit of flyweight gold. Sworn enemies, Chris Cyborg and Kat Zingano, finally face off for the featherweight title. And the $1 million lightweight World Grand Prix, that continues with a semifinal matchup between champion Usman Nurmagomedov and former champ Brent Primus. Get ready for the gold rush at Bellator 300 live on Showtime tonight at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. We are set for action in the Bellator MMA middleweight division. The number nine ranked Romero Cotton clashes with Grant Neal, who is fighting for the first time at 185. And you take a look at that. He's fighting for the first time at 185. He comes in at 183.6. This man used to fight light heavyweight. He is a stud, but so is Romero Cotton at 185.6. Here is Michael C. Williams. And we'll welcome all those joining us tonight live on the stream on YouTube and both channels, Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports. We are here in San Diego for Bellator 300. The prelims go now to three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing the blue corner. At 5'11", weighing in 183.6 pounds. His professional record, eight wins, just one loss, fighting out of Denver, Colorado, Grant the Trail. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5'10", weighing in 185.6 pounds. Right now at number nine. As a professional, he brings six victories, just one loss. From Hutchinson, Kansas, he fights out of San Jose, California, Romero, bad news, Cotton. And your referee once again, Mike Beltra. Romero Cotton looking to bounce back from his first loss to Dalton Rasta. While Grant Neal, he wants to continue to build on his two-fight winning streak at a new weight class looking Watch to be faster and stronger. Wait, wait, help, let's go. The bell in round one. We 
we've just witnessed the 908th submission in Bellator MMA history with Jenna Bishop, Josh Hokett with two submissions to get us started here at this landmark event. And Cotton immediately utilizing the jab to try to find the range while Neil changing levels, going to the body with the jab, lands that calf kick to the lead leg. This, this fight right here, both guys are outstanding wrestlers. And it might end up being that wrestling cancels it out. And they're going to sit here and throw big bombs. Yeah, Cotton was a three time NCAA. A division two national champion at ne University of Nebraska at Kearney and of course Grant Neal was at Colorado State so high-level wrestling football two great athletes and immediately looking to find the range and both of them probing both of them searching Neal with that overhand right and there is that incredible training Camp, uh, AKA Javier Mendez, and of course, former UFC heavyweight champion, Cain Velasquez. Good to, right, to see him, King Sun. Oh, it's outstanding to see Cain. So they're giving advice to such a good old coach. It's amazing that he's gone from being the competitor he was to the coach that he is now. Cotton was off balance, looking for that front kick, and then Neil trying to pounce on him, but Cotton utilizing the, the jab off the back foot, now goes forward with the jab again to Neil's face. So Cotton, of course, with AKA Neil, fighting out of Denver, Colorado in the Genesis Training Academy. By the way, he turned to 28 on Thursday. I want to give a happy birthday show. Oh, left hand to Cotton's face. There's a birthday gift for Grant Neal. My nephew, uh, Roberto, just turned 20 yesterday. Huge combat sports fan. He'd appreciate what Neil just did. Grant Neal looks fantastic at 185 pounds, though. We've always talked that he was a tank at 205, but was giving away a lot of length and everything. This, he's starting to look really good in here. He's in great shape, and he's landing big shots. We've seen him throughout his career. There's that attribute. He's relentless and looks to be in great shape at 185. They disengage. He does give Cotton his props as a wrestler, but he feels that he's better when it comes to being well-rounded. And Neil also told us that when we asked him, hey, what's your biggest advantage? I'm effing hungry. I need to eat. <laughs> One of, one of the advantages you'll see that I'll give Grant Neal on the feet, he just has better footwork. He moves his head off the center line a lot. You'll see him in and out. See how he just moved his head off the center line when he's throwing that shot? That's going to make it harder for Romero Cotton to land those counters or to catch him as he's coming in. Not that he can't, but it just makes it more difficult. Oh, another left hand that caught Cotton coming in. Under two minutes left in an entertaining opening five minutes. Both guys have had their moments. Here. Both looking to make moves. And Romero, Romero really needs to stick on that jab again. The jab is underutilized and he's being successful with it. We just saw Johnny Eblen successfully defend the middleweight title in Dublin. Middleweight division, we have Romero Cotton coming in, ranked at number nine. Grant Neal making his middleweight debut off to a good start as they now engage in some close quarter action, and Cotton just missing with that slicing elbow strike. Chopping right hand misses for Cotton. But he's loading up on these shots. He's loading up a little bit, but he's showing his hand speeds the time that when he decides to go, Romero Cotton is explosive. Cotton, six and one with three knockouts and two submissions. Grant Neal, eight and one with one KO and three subs. There's a body kick from Neal. Fainting and Cotton fishing for the uppercut as Neal changed levels. And there's Cotton with the right hand. Neal. Kind of uses that left as a battering ram, John. Yeah, he kind of clubbed him with it. Didn't land quite with the fist, more landed with the palm of the hand. They, they both crash the pocket and then dart out. Down to the final 10 seconds of this first round of this middleweight matchup between Grant Neal fighting for the first time at 185 with the sprawl on Romero Cotton. Cotton 
Nebraska. The first ever three-time champion in the 111-year history of Nebraska Kearney University using some of that uh, wrestling acumen. But, man, fast and entertaining five minutes. Absolutely. Both guys really going after it, showing a lot of intensity. Big power by both. And you know what's, what's happening? You let him get more aggressive than you. Okay, but when you're going, you're going really good. Okay, so I need you to give me more output. Don't let him push you back. I need you pushing him back. Okay, listen, you're doing not bad. You're not the bad. Okay? He's expecting these next round. Let's give him these. Let's follow it up with some of these. Okay, all right, now give me a big breath. Here's a replay of what was occurring here. Nice kick by Cotton, but the body shot and then the hook upstairs. That's going to be the thing. Watch the left hand here by Neil. Go, guys, suck us out, suck us out. Clean no, shot dead. right against the temple. That was the difference in the round. Neil. Grant Neal was able to land the heavier shots okay. and actually more in volume than Romero Cotton. I think that's going to give him the round. Neil just entering his physical prime, having turned 28 on Thursday, looking for more success at middleweight after a, a good win over a, a tough competitor, Carl Albertson at 205 and Bellator 290 this past February. He's had some great wins as a lineman with Christian Edwards out of Jackson Winklejohn. Got a win against him. He, it's not like he wasn't successful. Yeah, his lone loss was uh, against Alex Polizzi. It would be a split decision back in September of 2021. Looking for his third consecutive victory as we get round two underway. We're going to see if Romero Cotton can do what his coach, Javier Mendez, was talking about. He wants him to, to move forward. That's what you're seeing right here. He's starting to try to put that into effect. You always wonder how a fighter will respond, not only after their first loss, but Cotton was stopped via TKO in the third and final round by Dalton Rosta. But that was a Bellator 283 in July of 2022, so Cotton coming back after a long layoff. Yeah, that was a great performance by Dalton Rosta. Just everything was working for him that night. And Grant Neal needs to take a look at that and say, okay, I see what Dalton Rosta was successful with. And part of what Dalton was is in the grappling, he put a lot of weight on Merrill Cotton, got those arms heavy, made him slow down a little bit, and took advantage of it. Low kick to the lead leg of Cotton by Neal, got a fainting. Cotton misses with that high right kick. And see, you, you got to set those kicks up. Use your hands to set the kicks up. That's what's going to hide them. We expect to see a lot of dynamic kicking in the main event of Bellator 300. Usman Nurmagomedov, the defending lightweight champion, known for that dynamic attack. Red Primus at 38, looking to secure his legacy and become a two-time champion. Of course, it's the semifinals of the lightweight World Grand Prix. One of three title fights coming up at Bellator 300 as Neil moves forward, lands the left hand, and Cotton forced to retreat. Oh, and Cotton got clipped with that right. That's why you see Cotton going for the takedown there. He's looking to clinch, give himself a little bit of time because that landed and landed clean. Neil has one knockout win over Claude Wilcox, but that was back at Bellator 239. February 2020, referee Mike Beltran just making sure things stay above board and above the bell line. But, and you can see right there, that did touch Grant Neal's crowd, but he wants to keep this fight going because he's seen that Romero Cotton will start to slow down. He's a fast twitch muscle fiber athlete, so he wants to keep the pace heavy and he wants to put a lot of pressure on him. That's why he said, no, 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 I don't need the break, let me go. Speaking of heavy, this is heavy pressure by Neil now on Cotton against the fence, shoulder strike. Nice knees inside, but right here, look at the head position of both fighters. Look at where Neil's head's at, look at where Cotton's at. Cotton needs to start changing that up. He cannot allow Neil to keep his head off to the side there. Uh, Neil freed his right hand momentarily and used it to set up the body lock. And now going to the body with the left hand, hammer fist to the leg of Cotton, even as they disengage. And now it's Cotton double pumping. The jab misses. The jab misses for Neil. Well, Neil just goes for the takedown, picks up the single, but Cotton now looking for the guillotine. Yeah. He needs to be careful of that knee. Cotton needs to look towards that. Oh, had such an opportunity to land the knee there. Just past 
Well, we're under 90 seconds now, remaining in the second round. Neal is 0 for 2 in the takedown department. Cotton has yet to initiate. Well, he's now being... He's 0 for 1 in the takedown department. He needs a combination upstairs. And in terms of the output, Cotton has thrown a little more, but in terms of connects, according to our stats, very, very even, John. Very close, but... Uh, but the foretelling shots... Hey, Grant Neal right now, you gotta look. He's the one that's landed the heavier shots. But I'm really impressed with Romero Cotton. There's been a ton of pressure in this fight. It's a fast pace, and he's looking good. Nice job of going to the bottom. Cotton attacking Neal's lead leg. Coming up on the final 30 seconds of the middle stabs of this middleweight matchup between... Oh, that was a clean shot, and that hurt Grant Neal. With the red tape on his gloves and Grant Neal, who's just been rattled by a cotton blow with the blue tape on his gloves. So Cotton's best blow of the fight. Oh, beautiful body shot by Grant Neal. Ripped that right hand to the body of Cotton and leads with the left. And Cotton misses with the left hook, but lands a one-two. And then eats a jab. Good striking exchange here. Yeah, they're starting to throw him left here. Getting after it. Speaking of getting after it, a flying knee by Grant Neal. Putting the, the knee in his last name as the round comes to a close. And so far, Grant Neal in his middleweight debut proving to be a decent fit against Romero Cotton, who's looking to bounce back from his first loss, which was okay. via TK. Let's listen there, in, don't John. This tank. Trust me, you're not tired. He's tired. He's going to start looking for his way out. He's going to start getting real desperate. Okay? Now, Grant, when you want to finish this fight, you can make that call. You can make that call. Look at me. He's landed nothing. You got it in you to do it. Okay? Straight punches. Okay, straight punches. You got to be the aggressor, and don't be in front of him. Sidestep him, but be aggressive. Okay, you understand? Okay, what are you gonna do for us? You gonna go and take this round? We need a big round. We need a big round. Okay, give me a good round. Okay. Nice deep breaths. Nice deep breaths. A motivational Javier Mendez looking to rally Romero Cotton, asking for a big round in this third and final round. And Jacob Ramos giving instructions to Grant Neal. Cotton, Neal. Who wants this fight more? Cotton looking to maintain his hold on a top 10 ranking while Grant Neal is hoping to be victorious in his middleweight debut. And John, as we head into this third and final round, give us your unofficial scorecard and the reasons for it, sir. Well, right now, I have this fight even. I thought that uh, Romero Clapp did a lot of what his coaches wanted to go forward. He landed more shots, and he did hurt Neal with that one shot. Not that it put Neal down, but you could see that it stuck a little bit. I'm going to go with Romero Clapp in the second round, so I have an even fight. Both fighters trying to get the others, other to fight on their face. That's exactly it. You see, Neil just take it. Oh, there's a counter right by Cotton. Sorry, John. No, it was good. It was exactly right. But a nice, nice right hand by Romero Cotton. Good. Left from Neil. Neil looks for the takedown and gets Cotton down against the fence. And that will be Grant Neal's first takedown of the fight. Successful takedown. And now he locks down the legs of Cotton. But Cotton is fishing for the, the neck, but yeah, he's in no not, position he's, he's to get not, anything exactly. done here. He's not going to get that neck based upon, look at those legs. He doesn't have enough squeeze in those arms from that position, so. And there's an AKA specialty, thanks to a certain uh, Habib Nurmagomedov. That, that position right there, that was a Josh Thompson before a Habib. He just made it a lot but better. It's, but it's funny that Neil has given it to a guy from AKA. Exactly. That's what exactly it. rubbing it in here. So you're right, Josh Thompson will be joining us at the fight desk with Amanda Guerra as Grant Neal is all over Romero Cotton with just over three minutes left in the fight. Romero really needs to work himself to his feet here. Nice. And on cue. And there's a back elbow attempt by Cotton. 
what you cannot take right now is a mat return. He does not want to allow Grant Neal to get that mat return. Beautiful job by Ramon Khan to get away. Sharp job again. And I know I have to come up with a different adjective for the jab, but it has been sharp all night. See Romero Cotton using an overhook, trying to pitch those elbows together to make Neil weak. Pummeling going on against the fence midway point of the final round. Neil leaning in against Cotton, trying to sap him of the strength here as this fight continues to tick away. Remember, in his last fight, Cotton was stopped for the first time in the final round, but now coming forward against Neil. Neil with a beautiful lead left hook, curled it around the guard of Cotton, but Cotton comes back with a one-two. Came back with a one-two, but that lead left hook, it landed clean. Oh, it was a nice right cross. And another right hand, Neil unloading on Cotton. Under two minutes left, and Neil now looking for the knockout with the right hand. Cotton moving backwards. Well, Cotton's getting hurt by these shots. Well, you see, oh, he's starting yeah. to stand Hands are down. There well, again, eats a nasty jab. He's tired. And this is what all that work by Grant Neal gets him to at this moment. When he's got to step forward, Romero Cotton is kind of waiting because he's trying to grab air. Neal from Genesis Training Academy, hoping his Genesis at middleweight is a victorious one. Looking good thus far. Changes levels and takes down Cotton here in the final round. And that perhaps sealing Romero's confidence, but still a lot of time left, John, with the over a minute on the clock. We got a minute left, but Romero caught off of his back. And he's not that submission guy that's going to grab submission. He's got to get himself back, either reversal of positions or get himself back to his feet so he can try to land his hands. Well done by Grant Neal. You see him just trying to lace that arm. Look at him lace the arm through. That way he's got control of it. Makes it difficult for Romero Cotton. Great job for Romero to get himself back to that position on his knees. Forming a base up to get to that standing position. 30 seconds left in the fight. Cotton looking to get on his feet. Does so. Needs to find a way to break away from Neal. But Graham Neal in his middleweight debut appears to be salting away the victory with these knees and this back control. Grand Neal looking to make it three wins in a row, looking to defeat the number nine ranked Romero Cotton. Did he do enough on your scorecard, John? Absolutely. Grand Neal, in my opinion, should be the winner of this fight. Great fight by both what, guys. And they what really did you like it, about Grant Neal at 185 specifically? Gas tank. Look at the pressure that he brought. Look at how much he goes after. Look at the hands right here. Okay, here comes Romero Cotton, but the right hand touches. Best shot landed. The right hand there, and it was continuous, especially in the third round. There comes the right hand over the top again. And then he ended up going to the wrestling. And this is what Romero Cotton was good at, the wrestling. Grant Neal out-wrestles him. Puts him onto the canvas, and that's what happens when you get tired. It's a lot harder to fight when your heart rate is way up. Big knees right to the back of the hamstring. At this point, Romero Cotton knows, man, I, I'm just out of gas in this fight. I'm just going to hold on here and try to make it through. Great performance by Grant Neal and Romero Cotton. He really, really showed, man, he came out here to fight. Well, the body language speaks volumes. We've yet to hear yes, the judges' uh, official scores, but great sportsmanship exhibited between Grant Neal and Romero Cotton. Neal looking to win three in a row. Cotton looking to bounce back from his first career defeat. Too long. Hey, the devil is a lie. More to save you is the truth. Let's uh, find out the official decision. Here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at Cage side.
your first judge, John Marigliano, scores the fight 29 to 28. Chris Lieben sees it 30 to 27. And Elliot Kelly, 29 to 28. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Grant the Trump Neal. Brad Neal's maiden voyage at middleweight, a victorious one. Happy belated 28th birthday as he wins his third straight in the Bellator MMA cage. And for Romero Cotton, after starting his career 6-0, he is now case to defeat in back-to-back -back fights. Bellator 300 continues in just a moment. Follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. Tonight, Bellator 300 touts three world title bouts in one sitting. Liz Carmouche and Alima Lane McFarland put friendship aside in pursuit of flyweight gold. Sworn enemies Chris Cyborg and Kat Zingano finally face off for the featherweight title. And the $1 million lightweight World Grand Prix that continues with a semifinal matchup between champion Usman Nurmagomedov and former champ Brent Primus. Get ready for the gold rush at Bellator 300 live on Showtime tonight at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Bellator 300 continues with a contract weight matchup, 180 pounds. Muhammad Birhamov against Herman Terado. That's 73-inch reach for Birhamov. He's very good in the stand-up, moves well, has fast hands. Herman Toronto is going to have to use that 69 inch reach inside that full move. It's been a long time since we've seen Herman Tenato in the cage. Let's go to Michael C. Williams for the official introductions. Great to be back here in Southern California. No better place for Bellator 300. As we get set now for the prelims, a contract weight fight at 180 pounds, set for three five minute rounds. We introduce first the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 178.2 pounds, making his return to the Bellator cage. He brings 15 professional records, five losses, one draw, presenting Herman, the Titan. His opponent across the cage out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 178.4 pounds. As a professional, he brings 14 victories, just one defeat. Introducing Muhammad Bin Harmon. And the referee in charge of the action, Blake Grice. Mohamed Birhamov looking to bounce back from a knockout of the year candidate loss against Lorenz Larkin, one of the nastiest elbow strikes you'll ever see. Toronto looking to snap a two-fight right, losing streak in his first fight, fight in over five years. He represents San Diego, California, born in Guam, and here we go. Three rounds at a contract weight of 180 pounds, and Birhamov looking to test the waters first. Birhamov stand up, like I said, he's very technically good, throws straight shots down the middle, and so you're gonna have to see Toronto slipping those shots and coming inside to land his. Birhamov 14 and one with one no contest against Lorenz Larkin in their first meeting. Larkin emphatically won the rematch. He has eight first round finishes for Tenado. He is 15, five and one with 12 first round finishes. But again, looking to 
work out those uh, professional cobwebs. Five years before coming back here tonight at Bellator 300. In fact, Herman Toronto goes back to the Strike Force days, John. Yes, he does. You, I refereed it there, and you called his fights there, so. And he did oh. fight in Bellator, has the draw against Justin Baseman. That was back in April of 2014. He's 0-1 and 1 in the Bellator MMA occasion. I know, John, you reacted to that body kick from Biram. That was a heavy shot. Oh, even, there's the even though uh, you saw Toronto. He stomped by Biram. You saw Toronto get that arm up. It's that shot will make that arm come out slower now. That is a heavy, heavy kick by Berhamov. Yeah, just below, like it was like an oblique kick, but attacking the knee. And of course, those low line side kicks, and there's a jumping left knee strike that Berhamov teeing off on Toronto, who needs to get away from the fence. Yeah, he needs to get himself off of the fence. He's limiting his range. Berhamov is starting to really start to feel up and down. You see those knees coming. Beautiful. Check up there. He sees that Toronto is starting to dip his head down when he's throwing, and that's why he's bringing the knees up high. Berhamov working out of Kill Cliff FC in Florida under noted striking coach Henry Hooft. Greg Jones, of course, also helping out there. Toronto moving forward. He is at Gamebred Training Center with Barrett Yoshida and Nestor Flores. Biramov putting the pressure on Toronto against the fence, using the jab as a range finder from southpaw position. They're working both four punch combination by Biramov. Toronto built like a fireplace. Oh, he's, he's built, he's put together, but it's all of this nice. Look at how he's just walking it down, using the jab. But Hermoff right now has Toronto confused on what's going to come. That's never a good position to be in when you got your back against the cage like he does. Hermoff blasted him with the jab, blasting him with the front push kick to the uh, midsection. There's another lead right hook. The check hook by Hermoff has been there throughout the fight, and he is just beginning to pick apart Toronto, dictate the terms, and using range as well. Good defense, the upper body movement, just out of range. And Every, Chris Cyborg, who will defend her featherweight title against Kat Zingano, getting ready for action and uh, already showing her gratitude for the support here in San Diego as she will defend against Alpha Kat Zingano, a fight that has been talked about for years. And Kat Zingano coming to Bellator MMA and earning the right to challenge for the championship again. She's been a title challenger in the past in the UFC, but now facing Cyborg in a grudge match as part of our all title fight main card for Bellator 300 coming up 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific on Showtime. Bahramov doing a beautiful job up and down to the body, to the head, oh, beautiful jab. jab. And you see, Toronto is trying, he's doing everything he can. And he's, he's got that warm gumption. He does, he's, he's got, you know what, he's got no give in him. But man, he, he's just eating shot after shot. It's gonna start breaking him down. He's got to do something to stop this nice roll by Bahrama. Biramov has been living in Miami for the past month, sharpening his striking skills, and that is quite evident here in the first five minutes of this contract weight bout against Herman Terado. Kick to the midsection, and obviously, no real ill effects from that hellacious knockout loss to Lorenz Larkin. No, but like anything, Behermov has to be careful because it only takes one shot. And that was the first time he had been stopped. Ah, absolutely. Oh, and looking to stop Toronto with that high kick. And really, Behermov finding the range, finding the rhythm, utilizing that lead right hand from southpaw stance, goes downstairs to the lead leg. Good opening five minutes for Mohamed Behermov. You stay really stationary. Yeah, you made real stationary. You've been really heavy on your feet. Land on your feet, touch your ankles, and go to your left. He's trying to set you up for that power punch. Go to your left. Look who's hiding behind Toronto. <laughs> Biramov's arch nemesis, Lorenz Larkin. Lorenz Larkin in there. 
Here comes Berhamov. Beautiful kick, and you see how it blocks it, but it does actually get through as far as, watch how heavy it is, and watch the arm. The head gets, it definitely absorbs a lot of that shot. That's a beautiful high kick by Berhamov, even though the hand came up to block. It appears Birmov's already found his flow state oh, while Toronto's oh, oh, oh. a big wound up ball of tension. All that ready? muscle, Fight. all that oxygen that it takes to fuel those muscles and Toronto exploding out of the corner. Well, and his, but you can tell he's been out of the cage for five years. Yeah, but in his corner is telling him that you've got, you've got to step inside and throw your throw your shots. Obviously, he's got to change this up because what he, was, what he was doing in that first round was not working. So go out there, try to step forward, see if you can change the rhythm of the fight. He is coming forward more, but it, it is Birmov still landing. There's a counter left right by Birmov, and you look at the total strikes landed, John, and uh, doubling up in terms of the connect total is Birmov, no surprise. No, I think Birmov actually landed more than that. He's, he has been very accurate with the shots. There's that beautiful oblique kick. Body kick by Torado. Nice, nice attack and cap kick. Double jab by Birimov. So Torado definitely more aggressive and yet forced to retreat by Birimov's pressure. Smart pressure. Beautiful combination by Birimov. Two clean shots right on target. He's keeping Torado frozen in front of him, landing the combinations. Irimov with two knockout victories. Last one came against Brett Cooper, but that was way back in 2017, John. That's a lot of <laughs> But he looks like he's wanting to find the, the key to the KO here, mixing it up, even an elbow strike there, looking for the knee. So Birimov really uh, giving us a buffet of his striking. But all of these shots are starting to oh. oh, that was a heavy. Again, blocked, but he absorbed it, and his, his head absolutely got rattled by that kick. And you're seeing, look, look how you see Toronto just now starting to shell up. As Berhamov comes into him, he's starting to just shell up and not look for the counter so much. He's trying to do this explosive you know, exchange once he starts decides to go, but Berhamov sees it coming and is just moving out of range. And Berhamov as well, you would talk about Toronto being out of the cage for five years. There was a period of time where Berhamov was out for four years with a lot of injuries, which of course would question everything. And yet look at him here now bouncing back from his first uh, knockout loss and putting together a, an exquisite striking display against Torado. Well, you, you said it perfectly. This is just beautiful. Jabs, hooks for the body, kicks up high, everything. He's using the full range, and we talk about don't just headhunt, go after him to the body. That's going to make his hands want to come down. And he's doing all of that. You know body kick from Torado. You can't take anything away from Toronto, man. He, he's, he's trying to figure out. 34 why years this. of age, fighting a 29-year-old. You're right, he's still trying to find a way to solve the puzzle. No quit in the native of Guam, but he is pinned against the fence, now moving to his left, and yet Biramov has the game plan. Good placement of his strikes, diversifying his attack, but really finding on, there it is, there's a clear illustration of what Miramov's been able to do all night, and that check right hook has been money. Exactly, you look at the three punch combination, followed up by a knee up high. I mean, right now he's in a flow. And the body shot good. with the lead left. And this is what, you know, when we talk about, this is a volume attack. This is, we talk about volume. Yeah, he's thrown over, he's at 112 strikes thrown now by Beermont. So like, no, that's great. You know, this is what, like the Diaz brothers does. They just overwhelm you with so many shots, body attack. Oh, look at that, brother. We've seen uh, everything in his, his hand and elbow and knee arsenal. I mean, he really is giving us a smorgasbord of strikes here against the, the tough, 
Herman Tenado. And Tenado backed up to the fence again, and he is absorbing all kinds of shots. Not all of them, of course. What I also like about here, about there it is, spinning back his block, changing the tempo and the speed on his strike. Absolutely, you know, that's the whole thing. The rhythm of the fight, he's in co complete control of it. He's deciding when the engagements come. He comes in and out. Toronto is now you're seeing Toronto instead of even looking for a counter, he's just shelling up. And then he'll try to explode out of there, but he's not going to land those shots against someone as good as Birkenhoff in that. Wow. Clubbing him with the right and Birkenhoff having his way here with Herman Toronto, a dominant second round. Coming to the close as he knees Toronto. And Toronto puts his hand down on the canvas. Toronto did that before and then saw it went right to the body. Yep. Smart, good IQ, good concentration. Some might say Sean Strickland esque in this uh, performance. And what a victory nice. for uh, the one of the bigger upsets in the MMA, but he's a champion. And you know that Mohamed Biromov would love to one day call himself a champion. Take a look at this action by Verhelmov. Beautiful body shot. He steps back, comes back, mouse with the jab, straight left hand down the pipe. He had all things working. Comes at him multiple. One, two, three, brings the knee up. Just everything working for Verhelmov. Toronto unable to stop anything. Knowledge, Herman Toronto's family, his son, his motivation, his wife's smile. He doesn't want those smiles to go away, and he has five minutes now to come up with a winning formula in his return to action after five years away. Mohamed Biramov looking to bounce back from his first knockout loss has looked tremendous thus far, and uh, here we go. Final round. His contract weight of 180 pounds. One of the things I tell fighters all the time, though, you talk about his wife's smile. She's going to smile no matter what he does because she's proud of him. And they, hey, you, everybody wants to win. Only one guy can. You're right about that. And there's that lead right hook behind the guard by Miramov. Body kick by Toronto. Uh, but that was a nice, clean kick to the body. Mm -hmm. And the total punches landed. An avalanche for Birhamov. And when you're landing at 46%, and even better, when you're landing 53% of your total strikes, that's a that's a clinic, John. It's a clinic. That means that you are just rolling. That was a nice right hand that landed. Yep, here Toronto with some tenacity looking for the takedown on Birhamov. And the crowd here in San Diego cheering on their fan favorite. Man, San Diego, so many gyms, really a mecca of martial arts in so many ways, and well represented here tonight, both on the prelims and the main card. Well, absolutely. You take a look at you know, all these fighters coming out of the San Diego area, and they, it's been that way forever. Dom Cruz coming out of San Diego. Mr. Wonderful Phil Davis out of San Diego. Oh, nice left hook to the body by Toronto, but you're right. There's great lineage here, and I mean, one of the great cities in America for a variety of reasons when it comes to its scenics and hey, the sunshine and of course combat sports. This building is played host to many memorable moments, including Muhammad Ali versus Ken Norton, one of their three fights as Biramov going to the body, going upstairs, systematically dismantling Herman Tadato with just over three minutes left in the fight. And yet Tadato remains determined. Back with that big left hook, but again, throwing big winging shots, which take time to get there. And Toronto just took a big gulp of air as he ate that knee from Biramov. Well, Toronto has proven that he's, he was in shape coming in here because he has taken a ton of shots. And there's a massive takedown by Biramov as he tried to bounce Toronto off the canvas. Toronto working from his back. Began training BJJ at 13, has six submissions. And his his attitude is he'd rather lose by knockout than win by decision. That's the home in Toronto way. <laughs> That's what he told us. Well, and he's not giving up here, John, although, again, Birmov from top position. Watch the back of the head, top man. 
Garamov doing a nice job just continuing his attack. Nothing big, nothing super heavy, but every now and then he tries to explode. Prado just trying to tie those arms up, slow down his attack. You see that beautiful knee shield inside? Garamov posturing up. She'll be in court, as you mentioned, John By Tedado. A minute and a half left in this contract weight fight at 180 pounds. Mohamed Biramov and Herman Tedado, and they are back to their feet. So a, a moral victory for Tedado gets a chance to uncork something game changing for the game bred trained fighter. Final 60 seconds of the fight. A big deep breath by Herman Toronto. Muscles take a lot of oxygen. Muscles take a lot of oxygen. And so when does you, when you get punched here. Bob's offense. <laughs> exactly. All those shots add up. I'll give him credit. He has proven that he was in shape and ready for this fight. He just wasn't able to stop the technical game. Half minute left. Ramov content to touch up Tenado. You got to admit it was a beautiful performance. Well, Ramov coming the numbers, off of his only loss. Numbers bear that out, John. When you look at strikes, 122 of 204 for Ramov, 28 of 120 for Herman Tenado. Oktoberfest for Beer Hamal. Beautiful work by Baramov. Take a look. This is, he starts to spin for the attack, and then, you know, I'll just bring a knee right up the middle. And that's because he had, at this point, Toronto was unsure of what he could do to stop. It goes in for the takedown and just lifts. Beautifully done. Spins him down to his back. Baramov on top. Strength in numbers, John. <laughs> yeah. You go ahead, explain. Terado physically those. strong, but look at the totals for Mohamed Biramov. Again, a man who was on the receiving end of a devastating knockout loss against Lorenz Larkin in the rematch. Larkin in Terado's corner, but it is all Mohamed Biramov to the judges agree. Always a disclaimer now, in combat sports. I'm not even going there. They, they've got this one right. No doubt. And that's nice to see the two combatants already earning each other's respect. All right, let's get the official decision from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going here. Three judges at cage side for the decision. Brian Miner, Derek Cleary, Felicia O. I'll have it ex exactly the same 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Muhammad Bidahar. Clean sweep for Mohammed Birhamov, who bounces back from his first career defeat in impressive fashion, putting on a striking clinic against Herman the Titan Torado. Bellator 300, the prelims roll on. November 17th from Chicago. Yaroslav Amazov returns to defend his welterweight belt 
against the ass-kicking machine, Jason Jackson. Bantamweight champ, Sergio Pettis, and recent Grand Prix winner in the Bantamweight division, Patchy No Love Mix, fight to see who's best at 135 pounds. And Alexander Shabli meets Patricky Pitbull in the semis of the lightweight World Grand Prix. Bellator MMA, where warriors rule. Tonight, Bellator 300 touts three world title bouts in one sitting. Liz Carmouche and Alima Lane McFarland put friendship aside in pursuit of flyweight gold. Sworn enemies, Chris Cyborg and Kat Zingano, finally face off for the featherweight title. And the $1 million lightweight World Grand Prix, that continues with a semifinal matchup between champion Usman Nurmagomedov and former champ Brent Primus. Get ready for the gold rush at Bellator 300, live on Showtime, tonight at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Time for action in the Bellator light heavyweight division. The number seven ranked Dovodajan Yagshimudov meets Mace Rosansky. You can take a look at the reach, that 72-inch Yagshimudov is a very explosive, fast twitch and loves the spinning attacks, but he's got to get through that reach of Rosansky at 76 inches. Here is Michael C. Williams. Tonight here in San Diego, the Bellator 300 prelims roll on as we go now to the light heavyweight division. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds, introducing the blue corner. At six foot one, weighing in 204.4 pounds, his professional record, 14 wins, four losses out of Stargard, Poland, Maciej Sparta. Rosanski <laughs> and across the cage his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eleven weighing in two hundred five point four pounds right now at number seven as a professional he brings twenty victories seven defeats one draw from Ashgabat Turkmenistan introducing Dovle and referee in charge Trig. Dovalit Yakshamuradov looking for his third consecutive victory. Rosansky looking to bounce back from a unanimous decision loss to Carl Moore at Bellator 291 this past February. Thank you. Light heavyweight set to go three Ready? rounds or less here Ready? at Pachanga Fight. Arena, San Diego, California. You're watching the prelims. Bellator 300 and Yakshamuradov has been a part of a World Grand Prix came in and, you know, right into the deep end, John, against Corey Anderson and Carl Albertson. Lost both fights, but now has bounced back with two consecutive wins, including an impressive win over Julius Anglixis at Bellator 292 in March. Well, that was a great win against Anglixis. Yeah, he came into Bellator and they put him in the deep end of the pool against Corey Anderson right away. But he's a smaller, light heavyweight, but he's fast, he's elusive, he's got a ton of spinning attacks, and he's got power with speed. And he's one of the favorites at that. The murderer's row of talent at American Top Team. I mean, we wax poetic about it every show, but it, it bears repeating. They are just that good. And he's a guy who is, is always keeping everybody uh, happy and light and always there to do whatever it takes, including what he's doing right now. Exactly. You know, a bunch of guys that are foreigners there just light up the room there, and he's one of them. He's a guy that will help you in any way. He'll be your sparring partner. He'll help you in your game when you got a fight coming up. He's just a good person and a great partner to have in the gym. Right hand from Rosansky was never been finished. He is 14 and 4, 1 and 1 in the Bellator MMA cage. Yakshimuradov, he is 2 and 2 in Bellator, 27 and 1 overall. Well, this one, Rosansky is either controlling the center of the cage or coming forward. That's when he's best. That's where he made the mistake against Carl Moore. He allowed Carl Moore to control the center of the cage too much. Yeah, oh, and he just took that right hand. I was going to mention, though, when you talked about about it in the tail of the tape. He feels he is going to exploit his reach advantage, use his boxing game, but here's Yakshamuda connecting with some hard shots. Yeah, but when a guy understands footwork, he can take that range and that distance and make it work and, for him. And that's what Yakshamuda is doing. Lateral movement left and right, now circling to the right. Two minutes elapsed here in the first round. Rosansky out of the... Was a nice clean overhand right. 
You know, it's funny, his nickname is Spartan, and of course, Bellator 300, we'll hear more about that in, coming up in our open, but a fitting nickname for a, an event number 300 for Maciej Rosansky, and oh, and there's a cap kick by Yag Shamurdov. So both of these light heavyweights coming forward, both of them having their moments. Did you see what he did with his leg? Mm -hmm. That was a back kick. Yes, and a heel strike. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Zansky having a little bit of trouble with all that movement. Not able to, he wants to set his feet. Good intentions forward. of going to the body to try yes, to slow down absolutely. that movement. You're absolutely right. When you're gonna got a guy that keeps on moving, don't try to hit him to the head. Go to that more big target, stationary target, the body. Two minutes left here in the first round. Next Murodov measuring up. Rosansky moves to his right. Rosansky looking to use that jab as a Blinding technique. Oh, oh and he almost got rocked with that lead left hook from Yang Shamurdov. And yet, oh, there's a spinning. That's what I'm talking about. Like he's fast when he wants to be. And Yang Shamurdov needs to get that head off center line before, or excuse me, Rosansky needs to get exactly. that half center <laughs> line before Yang Shamurdov takes it off for him. Yeah, Yang Shamurdov is doing a great job with his head movement, putting his head to the side when he's throwing. He is Rosansky, no not so much. No, he's, he's got, that head is just stationary right down the middle, and that's why you're seeing Yang Shamurdov have such success right now. And he's mixing it up, going to the lead leg with, again, the, the calf kick and just Picking up those steps, utilizing the real estate of the cage, and all the right uppercut by Yek Shamurdov to the jaw of Rosatsky, who marches forward. Under a minute left in the round. This is the one place that Yek Shamurdov needs to be careful. Don't put your back and against the cage. The two shots from Rosatsky. You see that nice big black circle in the middle of that cage. That's where you want to be. One, two, three punch combination from Yek Shamurdov. Rosansky following him, not cutting it off, and eats another uppercut from Yag Shamuradov. Say, look for Yag Shamuradov to start looking towards that uppercut. You're looking at Rosansky keeps on dipping that head down, and he's doing it to the right more often than ever. There it goes again, and Yag Shamuradov's going to start to read that. Naked shot by Yag Shamuradov does take Rosansky off his feet, but time will run out before Yag Shamuradov is able to exploit this advantageous position. How's your Polish these days? Not very good, but he's telling him to go to the body, which he's right. He's talking about the uppercut, but the uppercut's gonna be tough to hit. Take a look at some of this action here, Yag Shamuradov, and it's a beautiful lead left hand as he's in the southpaw stance, and then Rosansky comes after him to land that right hand over the top, touches him with the left hook. But overall, when you're taking a look at the shots that were landed, Yag Shamuradov really was teeing off. He had a high percentage there of shots that landed. He definitely takes that round. Thank you. Thank you. Muradov started as a karate cop, wanted to start fighting, got into MMA, and now this is his 29th professional fight, round number two against Maciej Rosansky, who was fighting as a professional for the 19th time and just ate that left uppercut. Check left hook from Yakshamurdov. Good counter strike by Rosansky. And Rosansky coming forward much more aggressively. That's what his corner was basically telling you. You see, you're going to have to go out. You can't let him have that freedom of range. But the one thing that I've seen from Yang Shamur. Oh, oh that was a quick. Yang Shamur with that right hand. He's hurt. Yang Shamur forced to retreat. Rosansky, the boxer, oh. and he gets clipped by a counter strike from Yang Shamur. High trauma here in the second round. 
double change by Yakshamurdov able to take Rosansky down. And oh, after he tasted the power, the Polish power of Rosansky said, let's take it to the canvas, shall we? I think we're going to slow this down a little bit, which was smart and very well done by Yakshamurdov. Somewhere Ivan Putsky is smiling. <laughs> Polish power himself. So let's see Rosansky now with a BJJ black belt has nine submission wins, so is comfortable off his back, John. Last submission win came back in 2020 with the Von Flu choke. Very nice. Nicely done, but you can see he's using an open guard, but he's trying to move his hips. Yankshire Murdoch just staying centered on him. He's in the wrong position for a Von Flu now, but yeah, just a if he attacks the neck, maybe Yankshire Murdoch. <laughs> Well, as, as you're seeing, Rosansky trying to take it off center, move his hips. That's a big elbow landed by Yagshamurdov. And Yagshamurdov wants to posture up and bring down those shots. Look for his 13th finish due to strikes. See, here's that type of position when you're talking about Yagshamurdov got hurt by Rosansky. But now, Rosansky on his back. He's taking more and more shots, and he's just slowly and systematically allowing Yankster Murdoff to take the round over from him. He needs to figure out, if I'm not going to be able to get that submission, let me either go for the reversal or get my butt back to my feet. Yeah, he told us, too, that loss to Carl Moore, what it taught him, I mean, you have to be ready for anything. It is mixed martial arts, but he felt that he needed to, yeah, start thinking a little more cerebrally. And here now, again, facing... Yakshamordov in top position, Rosansky cannot settle, trying to stay active, trying to find a way to reverse sweep or get it back to its feet. And there now it's got the hooks in, got the butterfly hook. He's got the butterfly hooks in, but he keeps allowing the Yakshamordov. Can the elevator go up though, John? <laughs> Yakshamordov's doing a great job of having heavy hips. Every time you see Rosansky start to try to elevate it, he just allows his hips to get very heavy. Rosansky can't move him, so. From what I'm seeing, he's not able to elevate and get that reversal, so he's got to get himself back to his feet. And the ground and pound has scored for Donald Yakshamuradov. Rosansky does get to his feet, but continues to eat shots from Yakshamuradov. But great effort by Rosansky to say, you know what, I got to get out of here. That's exactly what he did. And Yakshamuradov with a big edge in the striking department at a 56% clip, so tremendous start. And now Rosansky turning the tables, but gets hit with a right and another right as they break apart. We'll see if Rosansky can start moving. Oh, thanks for moving back. back towards that fence. That's where he's had the most success. Yeah, more about looking at the clock, hands down, trying to utilize his lateral movement, trying to find a way to land another hard shot. A minute left in the second. Body kick by Rosansky. Nice, clean body kick by Rosansky. That had power on it. It's going to take some starch away from Yankshin Murdoch. And Yakshamurdov hasn't been the same since he tasted the power of Rosansky in terms of engaging in the offense. We saw him take him down, but here now he's on the periphery, utilizing lateral motion. There's a kick from Yakshamurdov. Would you agree, John? Uh, you're absolutely right. And I guarantee when he gets back to his corner, Art Levin, who is a fantastic coach, yes, unbelievable kickboxing legend. legend, he's going to start to get on and say, hey, I don't care how much you're moving, I need you to throw, and I need you to be offensive. Rosansky said his boxing would prove to be advantageous, has had moments of success here in round two. As we go to the third and final round of this duel at light heavyweight. Turkmenistan, Rosansky from Poland.
All corners of the globe represented tonight, John, at Bellator 300 as we celebrate this historic night here at Pachanga Arena in San Diego, California. Yeah, it's amazing when you get to 300 shows. All the work and effort of everybody involved, the fighters, how many fights, all those things. It's, it's an incredible accomplishment. From April 2009 to this October 7, 2023. So much great action to come your way here tonight as we get set for the third and the final round between Double it, Yakshimuradov with the red tape around those commemorative golden gloves, and Maciej Rosansky with the blue tape around his gloves, and they start throwing their gloves. That's what you need to see Yakshimuradov do. He needs to start opening up with those combinations that got him were so successful for him in the first round. How do you have it here going into the final round, John, on your unofficial scorecard? I have Rosansky needs to do something special in this round. I have Yankshin Murdoch up two rounds to zero. Rosansky keeping his attack boxing centric. The textbook one two needs to move his head off the center line as he ate the one two from Yankshin Murdoch. See, but he doesn't, he doesn't take it off the center line. He just kind of. He kind of brings his traps up, brings his neck in, and just like absorbs the shot. And it's great that you're getting hit. That's one form of defense, I guess. <laughs> oh, wow. Both of them. Delivering with bad intentions. Yaksha up both going for the level change. Yaksha Muradov snatches the single, has Rosansky against the fence, looking for the high crotch, looking to take Rosansky for a ride. Plants him face first, now into the open guard of Rosansky. That was a great job by Yaksha Murdoch because Rosansky did grab the cage and the pad in trying to stop it. Yaksha Murdoch, three of five in the takedown department, has scored a takedown in each round of this fight. Yeah, he did get a takedown right at the end of the first round. Uh, yeah. Almost for the See, I've forgotten more than I'll ever know, so don't worry about it. it but in this position, you got to go back to that second round and what Yang Shimurdov well, here was able to do. If you're Rosansky, you know, I've just got to get myself back. We discussed this earlier, John. He's got the half butterfly, butterfly hook in, yep. but he's got one, in the he's second got one, round, he was one able, butterfly hook. To, well, able to ele elevate Yang Shimurdov, and now Yang Shimurdov back to a vertical base, and Rosansky in the let's go position here. A little old school scene in the MMA game. You know, always be careful of putting your head in yeah. front of your hips. Keep your hips in front of your nice head. Nice be safe. Attempt by Yaksha Muradov, but Rosansky maintains. Past the midpoint of the final round. Yaksha Muradov trying to Get Foma, but again, up against the fence, running out of real estate, has Rosansky pinned, feeds him a right hand to the face. Rosansky now looking to swivel, and now he has Yaksha Murdov against the fence, delivers an upkick. He does, but you can see Yaksha Murdov just basically putting himself back into the guard, comfortable there. Rosansky not really coming up with much as far as any type of submission attempts. He tried to change the angles, get a little bit of a, a position on Yankshin Murdoch. He's never been able to hold it. Rosansky has never been finished. There he goes again, trying to see him trying to change that angle. Yankshin Murdoch squares right back up. Rosansky representing Berserker's team in Poland. Had the huge reach advantage, but on his back here with just over a minute left in the final round. Big elbow. These elbow shots, Yank Shemurdov is landing. They're clean and they're hard. Under a minute left in the fight. Rosansky. Being maneuvered to the cage in no position he well, wants to try to wall walk up to his feet, but Yaksha Murdov will try to keep the pressure on him from top position. 
Uh, Shimurdov doing a great job of taking away that posting hand. That's why he remained where he was at. Crowd getting a little restless, but Yank Shimurdov, you know, smothering Rosansky, grinding away. Wants to secure his third consecutive win while sending Rosansky to his first two-fight losing streak. And with time now ticking away, Yakshimurdov looking to deliver some ground and pound as Rosansky's been cut up. So, Yakshimurdov blooding up Rosansky in that final round, and he believes he's done enough to make it three in a row. You do too. Big John. I do. It was a big shot right at the end. That elbow just opened up. This is part of for the Spartan Hache Rosansky. Yeah, here goes Rosansky. Throws the big right hand and lands clean. A little bit off of the shoulder, but it was the takedowns of Yag Shemurdov that really changed this fight. Rosansky had had him hurt. Picks him up. Rosansky tries to cheat a little bit, grab the cage. Yeah, Shimurdov says, I don't care, I'm gonna put you where I want you. And from that point, really just, uh, just dominated. And here comes the big elbows. And that elbow strike right there opened him up with a big slicing cut on that forehead. Very nice performance by Yank Shimurdov. Gashes. Oh, that looks good. Johnny Eblen had a nice one. And man, you know, Joe Rogan may have said it best when uh, we saw Marvin Eastman get sliced up by uh, <laughs> was a Vitor Belfort back in the day. I won't repeat that, but Thank my you. goodness, Thank these you. are nasty. And again, let's give credit to those cutmen, the unsung heroes that, uh, you know, as Jacob Duran said, Stitch Duran saying, you know, you want to give them that one more round. And the cutmen throughout MMA have become so good and do such a great job of keeping guys in fights that they possibly would be stopped mm -hmm. based upon. Was it Forrest Griffin, Mauricio Shogun, who, where he did that with uh, uh, Forrest Griffin with the cut that he had back oh, yeah. in the day as well? The oh, yeah. stitch and here we go. Well, let's not take away from what we're watching right now. I know we're feeling nostalgic, but let's get the official decision with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges. Your first, Derek Cleary, scores at 30 to 27, while judges Wade Vieira and the Hadi Muhammad Ali sees it the same, 29 to 28. All three have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Make it three in a row for Dublin, Yag Shemurdov, as he defeats Maciej Rosansky. Rosansky has lost two in a row for the first time in his career, but Yag Shemurdov improving to 21-7-1 and, and moving over the 500 mark inside the Bellator MMA cage. He's now three and two. And he celebrates with his team from American Top Team. There to his right is Artem Levin. We talked about, hey, finally earning their keep tonight. Let's say hello to Amanda Guerra and Josh Thompson at the fight desk. Moro, it is so nice to talk to you. It is nice to see. You know, the thing is, Moro, it was Josh. You needed all this time to get ready. You listened to me for the first time ever and actually wore what I told you to wear. You, you kind of look like a prom king right now. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Got a nice little mic flag for Bellator 300. Everything you, matches. You look good, my friend. Thanks to you, everything matches. Yeah, for, <laughs> once. for once. <laughs> for once. For once. We made it to Bellator 300. Uh, look, this is a historic night. You started off as a fighter, turned analyst. I love being up here with you all the time. Taking a look at Bellator through the years, 14 years. We have watched this promotion grow. Look, some of the info here. 55 champions across 10 divisions. 55 countries represented, which I think is just truly incredible we've been to 94 different cities sometimes it does feel like that I mean what has it been like for you to watch to watch this promotion and in the champions it's turned out well for all the places and locations we've been with the venue or with the uh, with the Bellator it's been amazing but what I've loved to see the most so 
It's just the progression of the fighters, the progress in which they've grown. Not just the fighters that I, that I fought in the same cage with or fighters that I've seen come up when I was younger and when I was still fighting, but what I've seen also too is just how much better they have gotten, how much more they've elevated themselves to really elevate this promotion. And I love that about it. Scott Cooper's done a great job of building the talent here. We have three title fights coming up tonight on our main card. And you talk about all the champions that we're going to see. I want to highlight one in particular, Usman Nurmagomedov, 17 and 0. Of course, that last name carries a lot of weight with it. He is undefeated still at 25 years old. How incredible is this guy? It's miraculous. I got to be honest. I mean, like, it's just, it happens though with this family. You want to know why? Because they work hard. They understand exactly what their goals are. They, they don't let outside distraction. If you want to be a champion, okay, this is your choice. No one else's choice. You made the decision, and they they made they let that resonate through their family, and I love it. Uh, we're going to see all of that coming up tonight on our main card, but I hear the music, and that means it is time to send it back tomorrow. Thank you very much, AG, as we get set for action in the heavyweight division. Number nine ranked Davion Franklin takes on Slim Trebelsi, who makes his Bellator debut with a perfect record of 5-0. and 5-0, and outstanding wrestler, 233 pounds, the hybrid style of heavyweight going against a massive Davion Franklin, who's not 265. He weighed in at 265 right now, about 280. With the official introductions here once again is MCW. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Bellator 300, prelims will go now to the heavyweight division. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at six foot one, weighing in 233.8 pounds. In his Bellator debut, he stands undefeated at five and zero oh from Tunis, Tunisia. Presenting Slim Tunisi. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot three, weighing in 265 pounds, even in the rankings. At number nine, he enters with six professional victories, just one loss from Chicago, Illinois. He fights out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, all day. Davion Franklin. In charge of the action, new referee Blake Grice. All day, Davion Franklin bounced back from his uh, first loss with a win over Casimiras at Bellator 295 in April of this year. Slim Trebelsi comes into Bellator 5-0 hey, with three wins Slim, via form of knockout. Fight! Bell round one and immediately all day, Davion Franklin taken to the air, looking to get a highlight reel knee KO off the start, and he lights up Trebelsi with a 1-2. Trebelsi, who qualified for the 2016 Olympic Games of Wrestling gets denied by Franklin immediately. Well, Trebelsi's going to find out right away. First off, Damian Franklin, very fast for a big man, very strong. He's got power in his hands. He's going to have to try to work to get him to the ground. Just what he's doing right here, not going to be easy. Great work by Damian Franklin, keeping himself where he wants the fight to be. And putting Trebelsi in a position where he's like, oh, that didn't work. But he's just got to go back to doing it again. Franklin played college football, wrestled in college, and utilizing that takedown defense against the Olympic caliber Slim Trebelsi. Trebelsi at 30, looking for that front kick to the face, looking to do what Levon Chokoli did against Sabaho Masi in Dublin to kick off our main card with one of the highlight of the years in terms of knockouts, John. But when the heavyweights do it, for some reason, it resonates even more, right? It does. Look, there goes Trebelsi. Trebelsi and his wrestling. And this is where, look, his wrestling is outstanding. And when he gets in the top position, he just rides on his opponent. He does great ground and pound. So we're going to see if Davion Franklin can get himself out of this without taking any damage. Despite Franklin being ranked at number nine, Trebelsi came in as the slight betting favorite and is known for his ground and pound techniques, John. I'm telling you, I've watched this man in all of his fights. He is outstanding when he gets to this position, how he controls his opponent and just delivers big, heavy shots that just start to put them in a position they can take no more. Remember, right now, Damian Frank is the much bigger man, but he's got to figure out a way to get back to his feet here and not take these shots 
which are going to start to add up. Franklin fighting out of Albuquerque, New Mexico with Jackson Wink MMA. Already a busy night for that, Jim. Knee to the gluteus maximus of Franklin by Slim Trebelsi. Franklin doing a great job with his right hand of holding the left wrist of Trebelsi. And Trebelsi's trying to you know, say that he's holding the glove. No, he's holding the whole hand. He just has a big, strong hand. He's able to do it. Kevin the monster Randleman type knee strikes from long distance and may that legend rest in power. Franklin fighting out of the Englewood area of Chicago where he grew up a lot of rappers from that area including Chief Keith who appears on Drake's new offering for all the dogs and well Trebelsi and Franklin they not above making it a dog fight here in the heavyweight division. Nice job by nice. Damian Franklin. Looking to create some separation. Trebelsi stays Not right with drop, it. But no, Trebelsi stays on top drop. Beautiful inside trip. Stop, 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 stop. Referee calling for a break. Hurt his knee. Oh, man. Hurt his knee. Trebelsi overcome with emotion. Unfortunately, all day, Damian Franklin has suffered an injury. And it will go down as a victory for Slim Trebelsi. The first victory. round, a TKO win in his Bellator MMA debut. He obviously, look what it means to him, but as we know, John, you would rather have a more emphatic and, and clean finish than what just happened. But this is what... This is clean. This is he fighting. did nothing wrong. Nothing fighting. wrong. You see, watch this beautiful inside trip on that leg, but it's actually the other leg that was yeah, the problem. happening. Great work by Trebelsi to get him back to the ground. He just hurt his knee. Let's listen backwards. to the referee and Franklin see what they're saying to each other. I gave you a second. Did you my leg and you held your knee? It's a verbal submission. All day. It is. Yes. again showing the emotion of picking up his first win inside the Bellator MMA cage. The referee letting Franklin know what's going on. Well, I think what occurred is he a tap out, he, went to the ground, he, he verbally, he, well, he did tap. He but that doesn't go right. down to the records as a submission, even though he tapped as a TKO. No, it's going to be a TKO. I even, I even so, he tapped out. Some there was, there was no submission. submission. Yeah, there funny. was no submission. Please don't do that. But, you know, there's a lot a lot going on both ways. You yeah, see Trebelsi with all of that. And, of course, for Davion Franklin, he is obviously just disheartened by what's transpired. Things happen, you know, but Trebelsi's got a lot of emotion going. He's gone through a lot. A lot. He was picked up by, you know, organizations let go because of contracts and stuff. And this fight meant a ton to him. And he picks up the win, improving to 6-0 and oh with his fourth finish. You have to feel for all day Davion Franklin, who now is 6-2. and two. Right now, Davion Franklin's in that position. He doesn't even remember saying anything. And we saw him tap. Yeah, yeah and you saw it. It just like right. Yeah. Yeah. He got hurt. Let's look yeah, at it again, John. Let's take a look at what happens. Off of this is a, a nice job. Davion almost gets himself out. Trebelsi stays with this takedown. Works himself up. Controls that arm. Look at that beautiful inside trip. And when he goes down, Take a look at, see that right there? That's a tap. That's a tap. I don't care what you want to say. And that, that's not verbal. That was a physical tap. Yeah, that's tap. what I meant. Like, I and, saw him actually tap out. Lake Rice also said that he verbally submitted, so it happened. All right, let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the verbal tap brings on the technical submission. It stops officially. Three minutes, nine seconds into round number one for the winner, Slim Trebelsi. I'll let you handle it, John. Well, if there's no submission there because he wasn't submitted. It was, he tapped based upon, he got hurt. It's a TKO, but whatever they want to say. It's Bellator 300, <laughs> and it is.
Amanda Guerra. And what a, you know, a good start for Slim Travels. He takes the win. He's a perfect 6-0, and Amanda. And he was overcome with emotion. That's what it means to pick up a win in the Bellator cage. Absolutely. And more, I got to say, I love those gold gloves that the fighters get to wear tonight. Taking a look at our main card. Coming up tonight, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific on Showtime. A night of champions. Three title fights. And one we want to highlight. The first fight you're going to see tonight, our champion Liz Carmouche in the flyweight division going up against a former champ and Alimale McFarland. These two very good friends, but for Alimale McFarland, much more has been going on in her life. As many of you know, in early August, the devastating fires on the island of Maui impacted and displaced thousands of local families. Close to 100 people died watching the traumatic footage unfold in her home state. Alimale McFarland took action immediately. Within days, she set a fundraising goal. She hosted it on Instagram. She had a goal of $1 million. Within days, she had raised much more than that. It is now sitting at close to $2.7 million. Ali Malay is preparing for her fight tonight as she's facing off against her good friend in Liz Carmouche. If you would like to help the people of Maui and donate to Ali Malay McFarland's fund, and this is going to go directly to those people, you can click that, excuse me, scan the QR code right there in Donate. Maura, we'll send it back down to you. All right, Amanda, thank you very much. Uh, incredible what has transpired and what Alima Lay McFarland has done for her community, but unfortunately, missing weight won't be able to buy for the flyweight title. But we continue now with a much anticipated matchup in the featherweight division. Number nine ranked Henry Corrales collides with Kai Kamaka the third. I am looking forward to this match. 37 years of age and Henry Corrales has been there in against the very best against the very young and powerful 28 year old Kai Kamaka the third. Here once again is Michael C. Williams. For all those joining us tonight live across the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you here to Southern California for Bellator 300, where the prelims now go to three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 145.6 pounds. His professional record: 11 wins, five losses, one draw. From Kapule, Hawaii, he fights out of Las Vegas, Nevada. The fighting Hawaiian, Kai Kamaka. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 146 pounds. Even the 15-time Bellator veteran, now ranked at number nine, enters with 21 professional victories, six defeats. From La Mirada, California, he's fighting out of Phoenix, Arizona, Henry O.K. Corrales. In charge, referee Jonathan Romero. Action in the Bellator MMA featherweight division. Henry Corrales seeks his fourth consecutive win. Kai Kamaka the third seeks his third straight victory. Something's got to give at 145. All right, gentlemen, here we go. Round one. Are you ready? Are you ready? Fight! And on this historic night for Bellator MMA, want to give a shout out to the reigning featherweight champion. Oh, immediately Corrales chops down the lead leg of Kai Kamaka the third, but Patricio Pitbull, the featherweight champion at home, recovering from cervical spine surgery. He has meant so much to this organization. Speedy recovery champ as uh, Corrales off to a good start. Really nice start. That low calf kick landed twice. That will do excessive damage. And look at, you already see Kakamaka switching his stance into Southpaw. Corrales has never been knocked out. Kamaka has never been submitted. We've seen Henry Corrales in with some incredible. From the get-go, remember the first two of his first three Bellator fights against former champ Daniel Strauss and, of course, current reigning champ Patricio Pitbull, and then the third fight against perennial contender Emmanuel Sanchez. And Sanchez hit him with a knee that knocked five of his teeth out wow. and still fought all the way through that entire match. And the oh. guy is as tough as they come. Kamaka goes for the body kick partially, then caught by Corrales knocking 
Kamaka down before Kamaka gets back to his feet. Kamaka. Who's Las Vegas based head coach is Eric Nixick. A lot of success, of course. Sean Strickland these days. Henry O.K. Corrales fighting out of the fight ready camp. Henry Cejudo's gym in Scottsdale, Arizona. Takamaka also has Jeremy Kennedy in his corner. One of the top ranked featherweights in the world. He holds a win over Aaron Pico via injury, but Henry Corrales owns a big win over Aaron Pico. And Pico is on a, a rampage right now as we go back to see what just transpired here, John. And take a look at what happens. He reaches out, and his hand just reaches up, kind of catches Kai in the eye with a finger. Next startup company developing better MMA gloves, so we avoid that, or can it ever be solved, John, do you think? You know, you're always going to have a bit of an issue, but it really needs to come down to, I think you're going to end up having, we tried to change rules about, hey, got to keep your, your hands, you know, closed or fingers up. I think it's time to get rid of the fingers up, keep your hands closed. I kick, and there's a kick by Kamaka, again caught by Corrales. Corrales taking the back of Kamaka, Kamaka back on his feet, and Southpaw stands going back and forth, unloads the right and the left, a good counter right hand from Corrales. These guys are slinging mm. and they're going after it. There's a lot of speed involved. Nice jab by Kai Kamaka. Nice weaving, bob and weave there by Kamaka after he threw the combination. Just over two minutes left here in the first round. Corrales almost using that right hand as a decoy to level change, thought the better of it. Kamaka unloading the combination at range. Corrales keeps on touching that calf. It's going to pay dividends. It's going to, it's going to slow the, mo the movement of Kaikamaka down. And that's exactly what Henry needs. He needs to have a guy who's going to be stationary in front of him. That's going to help him. Counter right hand scored for Kamaka when Corrales attacked his lead leg with a kick and wide left hand by Corrales. Double jab, right cross by Kamaka, and he's switching back and forth from orthodox to southpaw. And he needs to do that. He needs to do that based upon how much that left leg is starting to get eaten up. And let's just be honest, Kai Kamaka is the faster fighter. He's got fast hands on the inside. And his feet move better. Henry's more of a plotting style. Kai Kamaka can be up, bouncing on his toes at times. He needs to be in and out. Veteran Henry Corrales in his 16th Bellator MMA bout at 37, Kamaka 28. This is his seventh fight under the Bellator MMA banner. There was the tie plug knee on the exit by Kamaka. Corrales, though, putting on the, the pressure. Stocking Kamaka goes to the body with a left hook. The exchange on the inside. Nice work by Henry Corrales. That's what Henry has to do. A little bit grimy on this. Nice overhand right. Just missed. Blood around the right eye of Corrales. Hey, the only thing I want to see, you're, you're being able to punch, you're being able to pass, you're doing everything. You're backing up, so then when you... Yeah, 
You mentioned the speed advantage for Kamaka. He told us that would be a department he wanted to exploit, but Corrales, who is Again, riding a wave of momentum here late in his career, Pleasure, wanting to keep it going, ready, but Kamaka ready, ready. feels his youth and his constant evolution would be the biggest advantages, and we'll try to continue that. How did you see the first five minutes on your unofficial scorecard? Unofficial, I give the first round to Henry Corrales. I thought he landed the heavier shots. He hurt that front leg, and he was the guy that was controlling more of it. It was close, but I give it to Henry Corrales. And you know, the more you ate, the more experience the riskier it gets to turn, you know, these things into a frenetic fight. But for Corrales, that's how he did beat Aaron Pico, was to turn it into a, a, a striking affair. And and when you look back at his career, John, isn't that when Corrales is at his best? Oh, uh, you know, you take a look at what happened. He got hurt. Aaron Pico hurt it bad, and he just bit down. And as Aaron Pico came in to finish it, he landed a big shot that put Aaron Pico out. Oh, and that's what he can do. He's got that kind of power. Attacking the back of Corrales again, utilizing that speed, but Corrales on his feet and avoids the left hook. Great work by Henry Corrales. Nice job by Kai Kamaka to go for that takedown. Oh, there's a good low kick there's to the that right leg by Corrales. That low calf kick, that is smart work by Henry Corrales. And notice that when Henry Krause is landing that kick, he's using his hands to keep Kai Kamaka busy and then goes after the low calf kick. He doesn't just go after the kick. You know, when Sanchez first started, 6-0, six, oh, six submissions was known as a, a, a ground fighter, and then Eddie Cha and he have uh, really uh, made him a complete mixed martial artist and has obviously done well in the stand-up with seven knockout victories. His last win via knockout was against the aforementioned Aaron Pico, but that was back at Bellator 214 in January of 2019. <laughs> this is the <laughs> But single shot, a pot shot. Double jab from Corrales doesn't follow up with the right. So right now, Kai Kamaka is waiting. He's waiting too much. He's got to get off. He's got to start throwing his hands, throw the kicks, and make Henry Kraus have to deal with the speed. If you're not throwing stuff, it doesn't matter how fast you are. Again, Kraus goes downstairs and just misses with that windmill right hand. Bad intentions by Corrales. Kamaka, quick jab. There's a high kick by Corrales. A lot of single shots, John. Combinations unable to be put together here between the, the veteran Corrales and the rising Kai Kamaka the third. Again, both coming in with momentum, both on winning streaks, both wanting to continue their rise in the Bellator featherweight rankings. Double jab by Corrales, puts together a right hand behind it, blood on the nose of Corrales. Seconds left in the round. And again, that, that mental battle being waged as well. The fainting, the, the mental chest, and both Krause guys coming forward. Both guys trying to set traps. Yes. No, no one's falling for him. And it's, uh, it's one of those, they're both being careful because they both realize, oh, this guy's dangerous. Yes. Out of their 32 wins, you know, almost half have been via finish. Under a minute left here in the middle frame. Corrales misses with the right hand. Kamaka ducking underneath nicely and capturing to the body. 45 seconds left in the round. And again, the only thing I want to see out of Kai Kamaka, just he's got to up the, up the ante, up the volume, start to be a little more offensive. Right hand by Andrew Corrales. Cuffing right hand by Corrales, backing Kamaka up as they collide again as they exchange less than half a minute remaining. Kamaka on the front foot. Low 
fiercely contested fight. And Kamanda should go to that jab. In the Bellator featherweight division. The final five minutes is upon us. Corrales going to the body with the lead left hook. High kick just grazing the face of Kai Kamaka, the third. And the third is straight ahead. Just got to believe it. Celebrate the one hit wonders and hey, we could see a one hitter quitter the way these two have been throwing at each other. We'll wait and see what the last round brings us. But both guys need to go after it thinking, I need to win this round. And they appear to do just that as they meet in the center of the cage. Again, Kamaka going back and forth. Orthodox to Southpaw Corrales point the combination. Follows the jab up with a right cross that just missed. jab and I think he needs to go back to it. It keeps Henry Corrales just a little bit off. Makes it a little hesitant to come in. It's fast. Go back to it. There's a whipping tap kick by Kamaka and Corrales comes back with one of his own loads up with the right hand. Stiff jab from Corrales. That was a stiff jab. That was very, very well thrown. Nice and straight. And the inside low kick by Kamaka. Corrales checks some of them, not all of them. And there's a right uppercut by Corrales as Kamaka comes in. And thus far, we haven't seen Kamaka attempt the uh, takedown like Corrales camp thought he would here in the final round. Kamaka over the one in the takedown department. Corrales one for one. That was back in round one. This is one of those fights where both guys are going to go back and watch it. And the one who loses is going to say, I can't believe I lost it. How do you yes. have it, by the way, with three? I had it even. Uh, I, had it two rounds. I had it even. I said both guys need to win this round. And both of them need to really step it up and say, hey, I've got to go for it. I know they don't want to make a mistake. I know that, you know, I'm, there's a lot riding here. But you've got to make the judges understand, I won this round. Now they are there you turning go. it into a street fight momentarily there. Corrales has had his well, fair share in his past, but delivers a nice right hand on the inside. And if it gets to that street fight, you know, type of scenario, Henry Corrales is the guy who's going to win it. If it gets into technique and just being fast and sharp, it's going to be Kai Kamaka. I wonder what the fans are saying. I think both. <laughs> Oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, Judging by this reaction, a little booze, maybe they want that street fight. Hey, we're in the home of the San Diego Gulls, turning it into a hockey fight. <laughs> now, like you say, John, so much at stake, and it is about maintaining your position, improving your position, but you also want to continue to grow as a fighter and, and you know, come up with those highlights as Corrales looking to pick up the mouthpiece. <laughs> <laughs> you do. And he's lucky that referee Jonathan Romero stepped in there for him because if Kai Kamaka's going after him, you should let him go. Defend yourself at all times. That's right. Victor Cruz going against Mr. Ford. 
Minute and a half left here. We got it going on. I think that was my friend Victor Ortiz. Yes, you were absolutely yes. right. He did <laughs> Victor Ortiz. Yes. Uh, it's hilarious. Well, maybe I was trying to protect him by calling You were, and I appreciate it. Victor's <laughs> a great guy, Close, close fight. These guys, they both landed good shots. Takamaka maybe a little bit more with the power. He's done a little bit more damage to Corrales. Corrales has got damage on the leg. That really doesn't show so much, you know, right now that we're seeing, but you're going to see Takamaka not, not walking well tomorrow. And with just over 30 seconds left, Kai Kamaka utilizing that speed, avoiding Corrales for the most part, and Corrales needs to bite down on that gum shield, and he's coming forward, time ticking away. Hotly contested fight at featherweight. Someone's winning streak is coming to an end. Corrales now stalking Kamaka, loading gun, doing? trying to turn this into That's a dog fight. There you go. Throwing the heavy leather, the crowd coming to life. Close the show, and Henry Corrales and Kai Kamaka the third go all three rounds. And if you're in the Corrales camp, you might have wanted to see that a little bit sooner. A little bit earlier, but that's what I was talking about with Henry Corrales. You got to make this a street fight. You got to make it a little grimy, a little dirty. And when he does that, he gets the best of a technician and a fast guy like Kai Kamaka. Take a look here. Nice kick up the middle by Kamaka. And Henry starts to open up. Body and head, wing and shots, but this is his style of fight. Kaikamaka is more that technical guy, quick, fast, sharp, accurate. But right at the end, I loved what I saw out of Henry Krause. Was that's it enough? See, I think it might steal that round. I think you might see Henry Corrales getting a win based upon what he did in the last 15 to 20 seconds. Doing it for all the dogs in that final oh. sequence. Henry, okay, Corrales, and Kai Kamaka, the third, go the distance. Kai Kamaka, father of four. Henry Corrales has a fiance. Both of them doing it for their families themselves, and of course, looking to secure their legacies and create and we talked about what Corrales has he's a mainstay in the Bellator featherweight division and this is 16th fight as they uh, go over what just transpired well if there's one thing you know when you're fighting Henry Corrales you're gonna be in a fight yeah. that's that's who he is and Kai Kamaka is gonna learn whichever way this goes he's gonna say you know what Man, I went against a guy just tough. Everything I threw at him, he just kept coming back at me, and I and I stayed with it. Or he's going to look and say, you know what? I learned a lesson. Yeah, Kamaka told us that, you know, he feels he's lost some weird decisions in the past. I, I don't know if this will be a weird decision. It's, it's a close fight. A close and fight. It's, you know, you see it maybe going to cross because of what just happened in the final few moments I'm of the fight. Honest, I thought that Kamaka was actually winning the round just by a touch. Thought he was being the numbers difficult. and then back Corrales up a bit, but you yeah, go, again, those those last shots. well, let's find out. Michael C. Williams has the name of the winner, ladies and gentlemen. For the decision, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side where your first Ron McCarthy scores the fight 29 28. He sees the fight for Kamaka. Your second judge, Derek Cleary, 29 to 28. He sees it for Corrales. Your third and final judge at cage side, Elliot Kelly, 30 to 27. Seeing it for the winner by split decision, the Fighting Hawaiian. And it's funny, they were split, and you had it for Corrales, but I... No, man! 
Do you take umbrage with this decision? No, not, not at, at all. all. And I said, yeah, this is one that yeah. you're both going to look back on and go, oh, man, I could have done more. Yeah. You know, it, but a huge win for Kai Kamaka the third, who has now won a three in a row, and that snaps the three-fight winning streak for Henry Corrales as Eric Nixick continues to uh, find success with his extreme couture faithful. Kai Kamaka the third improves to 12-5-1, and 6-1 and one in Bellator. Let's go back to the fight desk. Here's Amanda Guerra. Hello, Maura Ranallo, Big John. Uh, three in a row for Kai, and we have three incredible title fights coming up tonight. One of them, the continuation of the lightweight World Grand Prix, Joshua. You won two belts in the lightweight division. Joshua, that's what I get and now. And it's your Mr. Joshua. We decided if you went back in time, you would change your nickname to Mr. Joshua, not the punk, which you are still kind of a punk, though. Uh, the fight we're getting tonight, Usman Nurmagomedov going up against Brent Primus here. Usman Nurmagomedov, 25 years old. He is 17-0. Brent Primus, former champion. He's 38. Uh, we got to talk to Usman this week. He's getting a little cocky, Josh. He said, I'm going to make Brent Primus look old and slow. You've trained with Usman. Is he going to be able to do that tonight? I've trained with Islam, Habib, Usman. And what do they tell Usman. you? What do they tell you? Brother, you old like my father. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, you old like father. Uh, look, he's talented. He's got all the skills on the feet, dynamic, explosive, understands range, understands distance, all of those things, and physically strong athleticism through the roof. He has the potential to do it all. The question mark kick that he landed on Benson Henderson, jumped right to the back, rear naked choke. Benson Henderson's one of the hardest guys to finish in the sport of MMA, and he made it look easy. But with Brent Primus, Brent Primus is one of those guys, he made a show in his last fight, the grittiness, the toughness that he has within him to pull it out from inside of him. The, the griminess that he used, the elbows, the knees, all of those things were fantastic. But when this fight hits the ground, which I think he's got the advantage against Usman Nurmagomedov, if he can get to the top position on the ground, get to the back, he is a finisher, someone that knows how to use his world-class jiu-jitsu to finish fights. Big John told Brand Primus this week that he is coming off the best fight of his career. We'll see if he can roll that into his title fight tonight. Uh, John. We'll send it back to you and Moro. Thank you, Amanda. And we continue, actually, with a fight in the lightweight division. Speaking of 155, we have Sergio Cosio making his Bellator debut. Plenty of experience against the undefeated Jesse Roberts, who's 1-0 in the Bellator MMA cage. He is, and that was a big win. And he got 25-8-1 is just showing a ton more experience. Is at 6-0. Jesse Roberts able to get it done. Here's Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Bellator 300, we'll move right now to the lightweight division. Scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 155.8 pounds. His professional record undefeated. Six wins, no losses by way of Montgomery. He fights out of Alexandria, Louisiana. Jesse. And across the cage of adversary out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 156 pounds even tonight. In his Bellator debut, the veteran brings 25 victories, eight losses, one draw from Durango, Mexico, presenting Sergio Durango. Sergio Cosio looking to extend his blistering run of recent success. Seven fight win streak that has seen him amass six finishes along the way. Jesse Roberts returning to Bellator for the first time since he beat AJ Agazarm, the Jiu Jitsu star, in their respective pro debuts at Bellator 214 in January of 2019. Roberts now 6 and 0. Oh. Roberts is a very good technical fighter, good, clean stand-up. He throws straight shots. He's got an unbelievable ground game. Cosio, you're going to see, he is aggressive. He's a brawler on the ground. He's got skill. I don't know if he wants to be on the ground with Jesse Roberts. Yeah, we were talking about this fight, John. You mentioned that for Cosio, it's really all about that brawling style in the stand-up. Loves to bring that uh, Mexican machismo to the game. Mexican heat.
ball changed by Roberts, takes the single and puts Cosio on the canvas. This is where Jesse Roberts is just outstanding. He's got great base, great ability to move from one position to the next. Yeah. And he does good ground and pound work. Solid ground game, especially from the top position, yes. John, as you mentioned, and looking to go to work here. He has two submission wins. Both of them via rear naked choke, but now working from top position. See, very nice with the shoulder pressure. You see him. Oh, oh what's that lead to? He's got. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about earlier. And being in half guard right now, he's in a beautiful position just to start to control the fight. He's in a beautiful move right to mount. Look at that, Moro. That was just so cleanly done. Smooth. Now he can open up whenever he wants, start to posture, bring heavy shots down. Because he has got to get himself out Fighting of his position. Out of Montgomery, Louisiana is Jesse Roberts, representing Global Fitness Center with trainer Alan Gray. While Cosio, he fights out of extreme couture and has trained with Mads Burnell in the past. Mads Burnell coming off a huge win over the retiring Daniel Weichel. He ruined the moment on that interview with you, John. <laughs> oh, looking for the oh, arm here. triangle here. Now the arm He's triangle. off to the side. That is not good for Cosio. We saw Josh Hokett earlier tonight in his professional He's in trouble. And now Jesse Roberts looking for his first arm triangle choke submission. Cosio in trouble. Beautiful work right here. He is working to get out of this. Nice job by Cosio. Oh, big escape and this knowledgeable and passionate here crowd comes the rear choke, but so. here comes Roberts with his patented RNC. Cosio has been submitted on two different occasions. First time was via rear naked choke. The last time though was way back in 2017 via guillotine choke and he's in trouble here against Jesse Roberts. Jesse bringing both arms across, trying to figure out which one he wants to start to sink that choke in with. Cosio working to get out. Roberts making his pro debut here in Bellator back in 2019 as real Dossier's five wins since, and that's, well, Cosio's resilient. Well, I you, and he was trying to get the leg Whoa. free while allowing himself to get choked, and you look and go, you can only do that so long. Jesse Roberts moves back to top position. So Cosio defending the submission attempts. Doing a great job in defending and putting up with a lot of discomfort, showing how tough he can be. Forced to expend a lot of energy in order to defend, but doing a good job of defending here against Jesse Roberts. Under a minute left in the round. Steps right over, right in the back. He's got the hook again. Beautiful work by Jesse it's, Roberts. It's Cosio's 35th professional fight, and you see that experience because it is beautiful work from Jesse Roberts, but Matt, credit to Cosio for, for getting out of these submission attempts by Roberts, yet in still a lot of trouble here with 20 seconds left in the round. And there's Cosio delivering some strikes from the bottom. Of course, doesn't have the leverage you would from top position. But he escapes the round, does Sergio Cosio after dealing with the ground capability of Jesse Roberts. Good round. And he was just there yes. at being submitted with that arm triangle. Big breaths, up and down. Up and down, on my shoulders. On my shoulders, hands on my shoulders. Big rest, bring it, and big exhales. Big exhales. Everything's good. I don't want you straining in these scrambles. Relax and, and just play the game, right? You look good everywhere. Uh, you, you just you just gotta run it short, right? The pressure's on him, it's a big round for you. Easy, easy, easy got that round, okay? But, This round started really when you saw Jesse Roberts get this takedown and just continually put pressure 
on Kazi. And this one right here, this was close. He really was in trouble. You can take a look at his face. There's a ton of pressure, and he just guts his way through it. Right here is when he has got problems. But he's able to get himself towards his side, and that's what saves him in that submission attempt. Thank you. Big round Ready? for Jesse Ready? Roberts. Fight. Jesse Roberts, the blue tape on the gold and gloves. Sergio Cosio making his Bellator debut with a red tape around his gold gloves, and he comes forward looking to land the body kick. Now setting up Roberts. Roberts with a counter left. Lands on the face of Cosio, and if he has his brothers, Roberts, you know, would like to take it back to the canvas where he's one for one and almost finished the fight in the first round. He almost finished that fight. That was very close. They almost had the rear naked choke, but it wasn't as close as that arm triangle. But the real question is, can he get Cozio down in the same position and start doing so. the same work? Now he's there. Two for two in the takedown department for Jesse Roberts. Received some great instruction from Alan Gray, who's chief second there from Global Fitness Center, while Cosio was getting instructions from his trainer, Cesar Palomero Jimenez. Cosio, a BJJ blue belt. I'll tell you what, for a BJJ Blue, yeah, he did a say. great job of surviving <laughs> that choke, because it, it, it was tight. And when you mentioned Blue Belt, John, for the uninitiated fighting for the first time, that's at the beginning of your stages of yeah, your you're talking about you got white, blue, and then one step colors. above white. And yeah. it's, it's saying you're starting to learn the sure. techniques, and you, you have a good idea of positioning and where you need to be. But Speaking of positioning. A lot to go. And right now, this is where Jesse Roberts is doing so well. He's controlling the position. He's being heavy with the shoulder pressure, keeping Cousio where he wants him to be. Cousio's looking, he's looking for that. Uh, the elevator he's got, he's got the butterfly hook, but oh, slick. he just doesn't have the ability to work at the positioning that Jesse Roberts is able to move himself to. Coming up, we will see Leah McCourt, ranked number five at featherweight, take on the number two ranked Sarah McMahon. Leah McCourt, what a, a battle with uh, Katzingano. Oh. Talk about incredible reversals and scrambles. What a fight they put on. Katzingano winning the fight and challenging Chris Cyborg tonight at Bellator 300 as part of the Gold Rush All Title Fights card. Meanwhile, Jesse Roberts continues to maintain dominant position on Sergio Cosio. Yeah, and that was a beautiful attempt by Cosio to try to reverse the position. Roberts just shut it down, though. Again, here you go. Heavy shoulder pressure, controlling position, trying to figure out what he wants to do as far as do I want to try to go to mount. Cosio keeps on giving him the back. Nice work by Jesse Roberts. And we talked about, John, what happened in his Bellator debut. Revisited that fight against A.J. Agazarm, who has incredible jiu-jitsu credentials, and what Roberts was able to do in that fight. A yeah, great wrestling and jiu-jitsu uh, practitioner, A.J. Agazarm, but Roberts was able to actually be the better ground guy in that fight. When you look overall, you, know, you won a split decision. It was a close fight, but man, he proved himself, especially in his pro debut. And then he's gone on and won five more fights, six and oh, with one knockout and two submissions. Cosio back to his feet here in his Bellator debut with a minute and a half left in the second round. Cosio showing you exactly what those 30 plus fights have done for him. Unfortunately, he's wearing Roberts like a coat right now with the, the attack of Jesse Roberts who brings Cosio back. Cosio needs to be careful with that arm as far as it can get trapped. Yeah. He was trying to let go. And Cosio looking to this is where get young, that RNC. Can you look at Cosio's like Robertson? The young fighter like Robertson say, okay, let me slow this down and let me start to ground and pound. Let me start to make him pay for giving me a back. Win. I'm not gonna look so much for the submission, I'm gonna look more to make you pay. Cosio continues to deliver right hands to the face of Roberts. Roberts back into top position. 40 seconds left in the middle frame. Some elbows from the bottom, courtesy of Cosio. Cosio at least able to get him back to his full guard. Here he goes, He's active. Trying to at least bring up 
towards the triangle. Looking for the arm bar. Cosio does have 12. He's got some uh, submission finishes. Of course, he's got a. He's well. Both these guys very well rounded in many ways. But Cosio's experience, albeit at a lower level, now that he's come to Bellator, facing a different level of fighter than Jesse Roberts. Yeah, absolutely. Debut, keep his win streak alive, moving it to eight. Or will Jesse Roberts remain undefeated at seven and zero? Oh, the third and final round, and after two rounds, John, your unofficial scorecard. Uh, I hazard to guess uh, it belongs to that man, Jesse Roberts. It belongs. I gave him the first round 10-8. He almost had him out of the fight. Multiple good submission attempts. It's one of those you take a look. That's they dominated the positioning of the fight where it was at. And Cosio doing what he has to do, coming out, throwing leather. Cosio has to stop the takedown. Coach Gray told Jesse Roberts, "I'd like to see a finish." And I'm, I'm thinking, "Yeah, I'm sure Jesse Roberts would like to also." <laughs> but, but sometimes not easier. If you're oh. Jumping knee, and that was Cosio clocking Roberts, and Cosio striking, beginning to pay some dividends here in the final round. That was a nice pop oh, shot. Right Big hand right hand for Cosio. Roberts now retreating on the back foot. This is what I, this is what I believe Cosio has to do. Turn this into the brawl. You're the better brawler. You're the guy that you'll throw from any any angle. All these things. You're tough. Which just stances and lands the straight left. Right down on the mouthpiece and get after it. But he, what he can't do is allow Robertson to get the takedown. Knee and the left to the body, and Cosio now coming forward, ratcheting up the offense, knowing that he is behind the proverbial eight ball here at his Bellator MMA debut. Needing to secure the finish, according to Big John McCarthy's unofficial scorecard. Well, he's going after the body, though. With that Mexican style, let me let me attack the body and eat it up. It's hit some big shots. And there's a check left hook by Roberts, but then eats a left hand from Cozio and a three-punch combination. Three picks and the soda from Cozio. <laughs> Roberts, Roberts is tired. Roberts is sucking some air right now. This is this is exactly what he needs. Get into the clinch, slow it down. Not popular with the, the fans, but definitely for Roberts after Cosio's offense, definitely beginning to pay dividends. Now Roberts has his back, but Cosio staying in a vertical base for the moment. Trying to work those hands free. Fighting the hands. Yeah, Roberts trying to drag him to the canvas, does so, puts in the hook. And looking for the rear naked choke. Roberts has two submission wins, all of them courtesy of the RNC. Last one came November of last year. So they just keep on fighting that position. There you go. Good escape. Reverso by Cosio. On his feet, has to be careful of the up kick. Oh, misses with that right hand. Could have pulled his hand as it crashed into the canvas. Now looking for the guillotine choke. And he's got more. Wouldn't that be poetic? Choke submissions. Roberts yet to taste defeat. Knee shield by Cosio employed and wide base by Roberts. But Cosio, man, he has escaped many submission attempts by Roberts. Will he be able to escape the Bellator MMA cage in his first fight in this arena with his winning streak intact? 
Good. Nice, Flexible nice. guard. Nice work in trying, but he, he got to set it up a little bit better, control that arm. Cosio right now in that position where he's just trying anything, just trying to make something happen. And Roberts is more in the position of, I'm just trying to slow this down. Let me just take and get my win. I know I'm up. Slippery. Roberts finds himself on the bottom. Now elbow strikes from Cosio. He's got a minute 15 left. He could do it. The crowd here behind Cosio. There's a reversal by. Oh no, Roberts is in trouble here. Triangle choke attempt by Cosio. It's not there yet. Now it's locked in. A minute left in the fight. Tight. you can do and Jesse Roberts he's on top he slips off because he's tired Cosio goes after him and he actually I thought he was starting to make a mistake as he allowed Jesse Roberts to get this sweep coming over but he just kept the leg where it was at brought it over the top looking for the triangle right here it's not set but he's got the arm in place where he wants it now he puts it there now it's across he grabs and he pulls that in tight now it's a tight triangle. Now Jesse Roberts being tired. He's in trouble. When you see him go over, you know that is not a good sign. What a win for Sergio Casio. Viva Mexico! Viva Sergio Casio! The come from behind finish. The emotions running wild. He is 1 0 in the Bellator oh, yeah, MMA yeah. cage. And for Jesse Roberts, Arctic taste defeat for the first time as he drops to six and one despite all that effort on the ground. There was a ton of effort. Look, he, he did a great job throughout the, the entire fight. What a dramatic finish to this fight. Let's get the official decision here now from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Four minutes, five seconds into round number three. The tap by way of a triangle choke for the winner by submission. Sergio Garcia. A late nomination for comeback of the year. Sergio Garcia picks up a victory in his Bellator MMA debut and he improves to 26 8 and 1 Wow Amanda Josh don't call it a comeback Absolutely Merlin I want to give a shout out to the crowd here in San Diego they were absolutely loving the finishes that we've been able to see so far uh, a lot of representation with San Diego in our main card tonight. Josh, I'm not sure if you know this. Chris Cyborg, we're going to see her when she moved from Brazil. This was the first place she moved. Did you know that? I did not know that. Okay, you're welcome. And somebody who she is going up against, who actually lives here, Kat Zingano. But I want to talk about what has been going on between these two women outside of the cage. Kat Zingano, very outspoken about how much she does not like Chris Cyborg anymore. She says, I used to look up to her. Now I just think she's a bully. And tonight, she's going to try to take her title. And you said, if Kat Zingano has any chance of defeating Chris Cyborg, she's got to get her to the ground. Yeah, she's got to be the bully in this fight. She's got to push uh, Cyborg to her back foot. She's got to get her back to the fence. But Cyborg's not as easily pushed backwards as you can see against Julia Budd. She does the enforcing. She's the one that pushes people around. But Kat, if she's able to get this fight to the ground and do some work in terms of the ground and pound, threaten some submissions, and lay down the, those heavy strikes, it may put Cyborg in a position she's not comfortable in or that she's not used to being in. But Chris Cyborg has done it all, seen it all, and like 
She's only got two losses on her record. One of them being her very first fight ever. Look, it was a long time. She was basically undefeated for so long. This is going to be something, that, a mountain that Kat Zagano is going to have to tower. It's so appropriate that we do get to see Chris Cyborg fight here at Bellator 300, uh, the queen of the featherweights. However, speaking of featherweights, take a look at the rankings right here. We are about to see two of them go at it. Kat Zagano getting her title shot tonight. That is on our main card. But right now, Sarah McMahon going up against Leah McCourt. Moro for that, we're going to go back down to you. All right, Amanda and Sarah McMahon told us, hey, a win tonight, and that gives her or should give her next as Chris Cyborg defends against the number one contender, Kat Zingano. Zingano coming off a win over Leah McCord. McCord eager to reinsert herself back into title contention tonight. And she's going to try to use her size and length to do that. A 64 and a half inch reach for Sarah McMahon, 69 for Leah McCord. We'll see if that is a difference maker. Number two versus number five in the featherweight division. Here is Michael C. Williams. And for those that may have just joined us live on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you inside Pachanga Arena. Bellator 300 prelims go now to the featherweight division set for three five-minute rounds introducing the blue corner at five foot ten weighing in 146 pounds even currently at number five in the rankings her professional record seven wins three losses out of Belfast Northern Ireland And across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 145.4 pounds, just off her successful Bellator debut. The former world title challenger stands now with 14 professional victories, six defeats, entering the rankings at number two. She's fighting out of Sacramento. and Herzog. Sarah McMahon looking for her third consecutive win, building off her successful Bellator debut, Leah McCourt. Well, she is looking to put the ball back in her court as she looks to bounce back after that amazing fight with Kat Zingano at Bellator 293 in March of this year. And McMahon, who's been working on sharpening her striking with noted striking coach Phil Nurse, who, of course, very successful with the legend George St. Pierre all those years. But we have seen uh, improvements in her stand-up game. We've seen a ton of improvements. And the one thing, if you, if you want to notice, her hands are still fast. Moral, she, she keeps herself tight. Phil's done a great job of getting her to move her head off the center line and step in to try to negate that reach disadvantage that she has. But her calling card is her wrestling. Began at 14, six-time freestyle wrestling national champion. Here comes McCorko and McMahon firing back with the right hand. Quick level change, looks for the takedown. And McCourt trying to defend it and does so, but we talk about McMahon and her credentials, John. The first member of the uh, U.S. Olympic women's wrestling team in 2004, the first American woman to reach the Olympic finals, and here now looking for the finish on McCourt. Yes, and right, you know, what we're seeing is McCourt is in that position right now with her back, but Sarah McMahon stepped back. She got poked in the eye. She got thumbed in the eye, and that's what started this whole scenario here, in the, but she fought through it. Yeah, McMahon, a silver medalist at the Olympics, recently inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, and now clinching with McCourt against the fence. A minute and a half gone here in the opening round. Great work by Sarah McMahon to stay mentally tough, knowing that, you know what, she took a finger in the eye and just decided, I'll be the one to handle this. I'll get in close, utilize my grappling. She slowed it down, and right now she seems to be fighting well. McMahon has McCord's back, looking to drag her to the canvas. McCord desperately trying to stay on her feet. To the thigh by McMahon. Back elbows from the court. And there's a lacing the leg by McMahon. And grappling going on as the court tries to break the grip. 
Well, really, what you're looking at is you're looking at wrestling, grappling compared to judo grappling. Because McCord's a black belt in judo. Yes. One for her. She's got very good throws. I go shoot. Exactly. You're right. Just past the midway point of the opening round is McMahon. Here goes. Oh. And there is that throw by McCord, but McMahon still controlling from the back. It was a nice job of Sarah McMahon to keep herself locked to the body of Lee McCourt as Lee McCourt goes through with that throw. If she wasn't locked on, she would have ended up on her back with Lee McCourt in the top position. Under two minutes left here in the opening round. Of course, so she, she cannot break the hands of Sarah McMahon. She has worked at that. It did not happen for her. But there goes that. Oh, and McMahon. Or Mc, McCourt, McMahon ends up on her back. McCourt in the standing position. Cognizant of the up kick, of course. And of course, McCourt knows all about up kick. She should. <laughs> she got to win because of it. Yep. Nice elbow by Lee McCord. Under a minute left here in the opening round. McCord delivering elbows from top position, slicing away at McMahon. McMahon trying to block around and bound from the court. 45 seconds left in the round. McCourt feeding McMahon a steady diet of right hands. Can't really see exactly how many are actually landing, but Sarah McMahon not doing the right things to stop what's occurring here. And now she's just McCourt coming up. And referee has stepped in. Leah McCourt with a huge bounce back victory over Sarah McMahon. I'm wondering if they're going to end up going back and looking at the, it was an inadvertent, it wasn't on purpose, but the thumb did go in Sarah McMahon's eye. And there's eye. a cut now to the left eye of Sarah McMahon, courtesy of those nasty elbow strikes from Leah McCourt. Well, Leah McCourt did what she was supposed to do. She went after her. That was a beautiful job of using her judo to get to the top position. Right here, passes through the legs. Comes down into the guard of Sarah McMahon. And from that point, really started to just put shots on Sarah. It made Sarah go to her side and not respond. And that right hand just jackhammered continuously until opening up the cut and having referee Jason Herzog come in and stop the fight. Beautiful elbows here at the end. Just McCord's second TKO win, the first since Bellator 217 in February of 2019. That was via doctor stoppage against Atis Ozier, but Leah McCord bounces back with the biggest win of her career. Fantastic comeback win, and she showed how tough she is because she was taking shots at a certain point. She was in trouble. She just hung in there, took her time, remained calm. That's a big win for Leah McCord. McCourt turned pro in 2017 with one goal in mind, becoming a world champion. And she puts herself in position right now with that big win over the number two ranked Sarah McMahon. Possibly, you look at it, everything goes up and down so much. And you look at you, know, she's coming off of a, a very tough loss to Kat Zingano. And the featherweight division, let's face not the deepest division nope, in the sport definitely either. Not, definitely not. So every win counts, and here, let's listen in. Sportsmanship on the part of Leah McCourt from Belfast, Northern Ireland. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, referee Jason Herzog waves off the contest due to unanswered strikes. Official time, four minutes, 30 seconds. Round number one for the winner by TKO, Leo McCall. 
Now seven and two in Bellator MMA, eight and three overall. Leah, the curse McCourt, picks up the stoppage win over Sarah McMahon here at Bellator 300. Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. Tonight, Bellator 300 touts three world title bouts in one sitting. Liz Carmouche and Alima Lane McFarland put friendship aside in pursuit of flyweight gold. Sworn enemies Chris Cyborg and Kat Zingano finally face off for the featherweight title. And the $1 million lightweight World Grand Prix that continues with a semifinal matchup between champion Usman Nurmagomedov and former champ Brent Primus. Get ready for the gold rush at Bellator 300 live on Showtime tonight at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Bellator 300 preliminary action continues in the bantamweight division. Bobby Cerrone the third. He is 3-0 and as a professional all inside the Bellator MMA cage. He squares off with Alberto Garcia. 2-0 and making his Bellator debut. Yeah, absolutely. You look at them, both guys undefeated, 3-0 and 2-0. and 0. But both came in and made an agreement as far as weight. They said, you know what, we're not going to make this weight. And so Bobby Cerrone was up and honest about it. He weighs in at 130.2, making Albert Garcia not have to cut those final pounds. He comes in at 137.6. Battle of unbeatens. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Bellator 300, the prelims move to the bantamweight division. We're set now for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot ten, weighing in 137.6 pounds. His professional record undefeated early on at two and zero. Oh, he fights out of Escondido, California, and the Garcia. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 138.2 pounds as a professional. He too stands undefeated. He brings three victories without a defeat from Vallejo, California. Bobby, the humble warrior, Cerrone. And the referee in charge, Blake Grice. Bobby Cerrone fan club well represented here tonight fighting out of Vallejo, California and he takes on Alberto Garcia who was out at Escondido so it's a battle of Golden State Gladiators right, with uh, Alberto, someone ready? Zoe. Bobby you ready? Maybe. <laughs> About to disappear we'll see what happens. to the body right hand upstairs just missed <laughs> real difference here both guys love to stand up Geronio comes from a karate style background been a martial artist his entire life the wrestling is where I think he has a slight advantage over Garcia and we'll see if that starts to take place in this fight Here in the first stand, Serrano again unloading, switches stances, misses with the left high kick. Back to it to go. Garcia's 
see it getting a little too square. Oh, a blind drop kick from Alberto Garcia. Switched up on that guillotine. He had it deep. He rattled Garcia with the right hand and now ground and pound. But you're right, he had the guillotine. It was deep and he just let it go. But that's, you know, he obviously he felt and something. Garcia back to his feet and Garcia now on the back of Tronio. Unbelievable. Quick reversal of fortune for Alberto Garcia. Garcia got dropped. Incredible turn of events in the first two minutes of this fight between the unbeaten Bobby Cerrone and Alberto Garcia. Right now, Bobby Cerrone is going, how in the world did I end up here? And look at Cerrone now in trouble with the rear naked choke attempt by Garcia. You're right, John. It was just seconds ago where he was on the verge of perhaps finishing the fight, and now he's in danger. Both men just need to settle down a little bit right here. Cerrone has already got one leg free. He just needs to control the hands, get his composure. Same with Garcia. He wants to try to reestablish that left hook if he can. There's the reversal by Cerrone. Waist lock as they get up back to their feet. So good recovery by Cerrone. Equally good recovery by Garcia exactly. after what happened. happened to him. So Garcia was rocking. He just came right back. Cerrone takes Garcia to the mat. There's the wrestling I was talking about. He has gotten some good wrestling. Yeah, wrestled for Sac City College for two years. Minute 45 left in the first round. Garcia rolling to escape. Now north south position by Cerrone. Very nice work. By Cerrone to be able to catch that position. We'll see if he's able to do it. Well, great job by Garcia. He just keeps on fighting through. Has that wrestling background. Two promising prospects. These two were supposed to face off at Bellator 292 last March. Now putting their wares on display here in front of this crowd in San Diego, California, Pachanga Arena, celebrating Bellator 300. Cerrone and Garcia in the stand-up. Garcia, oh, belly to back, suplex, but Garcia bouncing back up to his feet. Garcia's like a rubber ball. <laughs> <laughs> Under a minute left of the first. He hits the ground, he's bouncing back up, man. 28-year-old Garcia, 25-year-old Cerrone. Under half a minute remaining, side kick to the leg of Garcia by Cerrone. There's a one to the back, Garcia. Some serious bruising to the back right leg of Bobby Cerrone. If you look, I don't know. I don't remember seeing that before. Well, we've seen some good stuff here in the first five minutes as Garcia gets the takedown at the bell. Right, the side kick is there. The whole time. Step don't be doing nothing fancy no more, right? Get up to your feet, okay? Sit to the don't be dripping and flipping no more. No more of that, okay? All right, when he had his back, he stayed on his back, he controlled him, he could control him. Just hit him a little bit, stay there the whole round. Win the round, yeah. Hold that back off, dog. You got it, we're fine. Here was the right hand landed by Seronio. That's the one that put Garcia down. Let's take another look. That is a beautiful shot. And look at this, John. <laughs> Front naked choke being applied momentarily as Cerrone taking the back. But you're right, John. He let go of the submission attempt where he was establishing control, and it cost him. I, I'm, I'm not sure why he felt something. All right, here we go. He's not sure why he did. You ready? Ready? The 
Bell and round to number two, and it quickly, Geronio staggers Garcia again with the right hand. I'm telling you, Garcia's made of rubber. He just bounces. He gets hit, bounces right back like nothing happened. Right against Romeo steps up, goes to the body lock, backs Garcia to the fence. Again, this is where Mr. Romeo, he can do good work. Nice attempt by Garcia. Oh. Romeo back. Is on him again, backs him back to the fence, and it gone here in the second. Knee from Garcia to the rib cage of Soronia. Alberto Garcia, 2 0 with one knockout. Bobby Soronio, the third, 3 0 with one knockout. All three of Soronio's fights have come inside the Bellator MMA cage. Garcia making his Bellator debut and reversing position on Soronia. Soronio reversing position on him, he's yes. in top position. And now. then back and forth we go. Great. Incredible scrambles. Right now, Bobby Sirhan is going, what is this guy made of? And he just keeps on bouncing around, going all over. He's absorbed some big shots. It's been over a year and a half since Garcia last fought. So it's been a while for Serronio. He's coming off a win over Miguel Painbert in October of last year, so a bit of a delay for him, too. And in fact, they both are coming off both yeah. wins over Miguel Pamberg, who we will see in action tonight. Nice work by Cerrone. Look at him lace the arm there. He's got his right arm coming around the back and holding the right arm of Garcia. Gets it free, but he needs some big shots before that happens. Midpoint of the round and the fight. Cerrone again trying to feed that hand. Flexible Garcia on his back. Trying to feed the right arm. Ground and pound with that right hand. Chance of Bobby bringing out here at Pachanga Arena in San Diego. The humble warrior, Bobby Cerrone the third. Under two minutes left in the round, looking for the it's solution. Yeah. Good escape by Garcia, back to the choke by Cerrone. Cerrone looking for his first submission win. Like putting on a great yeah, and got the young yeah. fighters. Look at that. An escape right to the back of Cerrone. In the back. Amazing back take by Garcia. Blood trickling down the side of his left eye. Cerrone always in a position of, yeah, I have my time. Go ahead. You can have yours for a little bit here. Well, Cerrone quick to give Garcia praise as a wrestler, saying he's a stud in wrestling, has a specific skill set. Well, we've seen him show resiliency, good submission defense, and good at reversal sweeps here a minute left in the round. Again, he's got the one leg free, so he can turn inside of that position. Many times we go for the big maneuver instead of putting our weight onto that leg, crushing it down to the ground, and just getting to a better position. Esther Lynn taking her amazing photos there at cage side, getting up close, and big part of Bellator MMA all these years. So many people behind the scenes. And here we are, 25 seconds left in the second round, and Garcia behind Soronio, literally has his back. Soronio firing off some strikes. But Time ticking away. Garcia unable to get really any strikes off, any submission attempts. There he goes with a couple. Two undefeated prospects heading to the third and final round of Bellator 300.
Now peace out. Let's keep it standing now, okay? Don't turn around. All right, let's keep it standing. All right, let's take him down. Don't worry about taking him down. Huh? Okay. All right, let's go. Okay, okay. yes, no. Bobby Seronio Sr. wants his son to keep it in the stand-up department. Let's see what's going on in the Garcia corner. You gotta win, you gotta win this round. Down, beat him up. Big round. Take him down. Stay in his guard if you have to. Nothing fancy. And you can see it to the right side on the left part of the screen. That's Derek Anderson, long time, lightweight stud at Bellator. stages of their career, Seronio, Garcia. How do you have it going into the final round, John? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I gotta, I'm gonna say Seronio is winning the fight right now. Garcia's gonna have to find something to do, but it's been back and forth, it's close. Statistically speaking, Seronio has an edge in terms of the striking department. You look at the wrestling department, Seronio two for five in takedowns, Garcia one for two. We've seen a lot of great action on the ground, near submissions, reversals. And now let's see what Seronio's able to do, if he's able to do what his dad wants him to do and keep it in the stand-up and deliver. Yeah, we'll see. That's a nice kick to the body, Garcia. Low-line sidekick to the knee there by Soronio. Oh. Just a little bit off. It touched, but it didn't touch the top. Side low kick checked by Garcia. Garcia squaring up to Seronio, hands low, baiting him. Oh, Superman punched himself up. Is that what that was? It looked like that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Wanting to get Garcia to bite, he right hand sent saliva from the mouth of Garcia. That right hand landed, oh, nice body shot. And now Seronio snatches the neck again. Garcia has proven that he definitely has a chin because he's been hit with some big shots. And he just keeps on bouncing right back. Three minutes left in the fight. Garcia needs to put together an offensive rally. The time by the referee is the mouthpiece will be put back in Garcia's mouth while he's doing his own housekeeping. He's a warrior. <laughs> his nickname is Wonder Boy slash Batman. So I guess it was a Batman punch, not a Superman punch. Maybe that's why it looked the way it did. <laughs> Midway point of the final round. the defense on display. The wrestler Garcia looking to get the take down in top position on Seronio. Over two minutes left in the fight. Well done. Very nice movement. And good reversal. Seronio holding on to that leg because he knows he's going to put him in a position to try to at least get out of here. Garcia all over it. Left hands by Garcia. Knee strike has Seronio's back. Garcia very active. Garcia just throws things from everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's like that Batman punch. <laughs> Seronio back to his feet. Oh, Matt return. Well done. Minute and a half left in the fight. Garcia looking to capitalize on this dominant position with. Just over a minute left here, looking to move to three and O, oh, while Seronia looks to go to four and O. Oh. Seronia fighting the hands, trying to break the grip for Garcia. Oh. 
final 60 seconds of this battle between these two undefeated prospects. All those times you see standing back up and then the bat return, that's demoralizing and that's when you start to make mistakes. Crowd looking to rally Bobby Serrano the third Garcia. Keeping him tied up. Elbow from Serrano. And then Garcia says, I'll neutralize that too. He looked like oh, a twister. twister. Hey, he's almost. Ah, reversal by Serrano in the north south position. Good stuff between. The humble warrior Bobby Soronio III and Alberto Garcia still very much in the early stages of their MMA career, but we we saw a little bit of everything, including the, the heart. And yes, someone's O must go here tonight at Pachanga Arena, John. Bobby Soronio III and Alberto Garcia embrace. Fun fight. That was the both guys going for it. You gotta love yep. it. Alberto Garcia from North County MMA and Team Explode. Head coach is Johnny Hughes. Trains with uh, Derek Anderson and Robbie Peralta. Representing Escondido, California. Proud of his Mexican heritage. And of course, the humble warrior Bobby Serrano III, just 25 years of age. All four of his fights here in the Bellator MMA cage. And he is hugging his father. Wondering what lies ahead. Here we go, John. It was the big right hand at the beginning. That's the one. That oh, put, mouthpiece, goodbye. Put the mouthpiece out. Still didn't go down as he absorbed it well. He's <laughs> points over like, yeah, I, I need that. <laughs> mouthpiece goes out. But Bobby Cerrone found out that, man, Mr. Garcia was here to fight, fighting till the end. Great effort by both of these young fighters. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. All three, Brian Miner, Hadi Mohammed Ali, and Felicia O. All have it exactly the same 30 to 27. All for the winner by unanimous decision. Serrano the third improves to four and zero. Oh. He hands Alberto Garcia's first loss as he falls to two and one. Two hungry prospects putting on a show, and Serrano being serenaded by chance of Bobby. We will have bonus action coming up following the main card of Bellator 300. Join us for three post limbs bonus coverage coming your way from Pachanga Arena and coming up at 10 o'clock Eastern 7 Pacific on Showtime it is Bellator 300 the gold rush three title fights Usman Nurmagomedov defends the title at lightweight against former champ Brent Primus the undefeated champion looking to defend in the semifinals of the lightweight world grand prix Chris Cyborg defends a featherweight title against number one ranked contender Katzen Gano Liz Carmouche well, if she wins or it's a draw, she retains the flyweight title. Former champion Alimale McFarlane, Miss Weight, is not eligible to win the title. If she beats Carmouche, the title will be vacated. Join us for Bellator 300, the gold rush at the top of the hour from Pachanga Arena in San Diego, California. Tonight, Bellator
Bellator 300 touts three world title bouts in one sitting. Liz Carmouche and Alima Lane McFarland put friendship aside in pursuit of flyweight gold. Sworn enemies for Cyborg and Katz and Gano finally face off for the featherweight title. And the $1 million lightweight World Grand Prix that continues with a semifinal matchup between champion Usman Nurmagomedov and former champ Brent Primus. Get ready for the gold rush at Bellator 300 live on Showtime tonight at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Usman Nurmagomedov vanquishes Benson Henderson and does it in quick fashion. The Bellator MMA World Grand Prix is the ultimate test of skill and will. Eight elite fighters were drafted to compete for the $1 million prize with lightweight champion Usman Nurmagomedov at the center of MMA's most exciting knockout tournament. Opening the Grand Prix was a fiery face-off between rising star Tofik Musayev and the always indomitable Alexander Shibli. A surprising stopper from Shibli in the final minute silenced the SAP Center with Shabli cementing himself one to watch in the tournament. The undefeated king of the lightweights, Uzman Nurmagomedov, came into the Grand Prix as a big favorite. His first tournament title defense was a fight against MMA vet and former world champion Smooth Benson Henderson. But it was Nurmagomedov by name, it was Nurmagomedov by nature. Uzman secured the win with an epic submission in round one to book his spot in the semifinals. Fight fans in Paris were treated to one of the best fights of the year as France's own Mansar Barnoui faced off against MMA veteran and former lightweight champ Brett Primus. Firing at each other for over five rounds, it was Primus that got the best of Barnoui and booked his ticket to the semifinals via unanimous decision. After an injury forced former Grand Prix winner AJ McKee to withdraw, Bellator legend Patricky Pitbull would instead face rising fan favorite Roberto De Souza inside the iconic Saitama Super Arena. The former Bellator lightweight world champ took down D'Souza with a powerful kick to progress himself to the semifinals and cement his spot as Bellator's all-time top knockout leader. Up next, the Bellator lightweight Grand Prix enters the semifinals as Bellator lights up San Diego with an epic night of champions at the Pachanga Arena. Champ Usman Nurmagomedov and Brent Primus both look to become the first fighter to book their spot in the finals when they collide in the main event of Bellator 300. We then head back to the Windy City as Alexander Shepley and Patrici Pitbull face off at the Wintrust Arena. Can the rising star defeat the former champ? But who do you think will reach the final? The road to one million dollars continues live this Saturday night on Showtime. Jab and then bang right on the jaw. Incredibly accurate right cross. Man, that is a fight in the midway through round one. And that uppercut lands over and over. 
and the return from Rampage. Fedor doing a very good job of actually confusing Rampage about where he's going to attack. Big shot. Oh, Watch the shot here. Right hand just starches him. He goes face forward. You see a guy shaking his head. What is it telling you as the referee? I don't want to be where I'm at. I don't want to be in this fight. And that's why it was stopped. A good stop. Allow Chris to throw that blitz and get you against the cage. Oh, oh, and get Put her in that position. Right hand. Watch the watch the right hand again. Boom. Right on the chin. Kavanaugh goes down. She tries to sit up. She's out. And then gets woken up by the next shot. The bell in round number one. You see, you see already when they're close to each other, Jay Silva. Oh, good left hand. The end is there. And that is it. Just like that. Game, set, match. Hector Lombard. This, the black. this is in real time. That right hook, left combination, he is clearly out. Wow. Another look at, we can see it 10 times. Wow. I'm being told right now it's a six second knockout. That right hand on the button started off big. Left hand right behind it. As soon as he hit the floor, he was out. Number four length heavyweight champion Ryan Bader competing for the first oh. time. Anyway, he's already dropped the ball with the left hand. Ryan Dark Bader. And Bader beats comes down both that left hook just stuns Mo puts him back on his heels comes after him and look at when when Vader's on top of you that that leg hit him didn't help you see Mo get in trouble he starts to go flat the shots keep coming a minute 13 now left and there's that head kick and now there's the It's by Dan. Huge shot. Again, going after him, and this is 